Okay. Good morning. Uh, I would like to welcome you to our third uh, day uh, of conference, uh, of the conference, The Terms of Habitation. Uh, I'm Gaia Caramellino and I will be the chair of this session devoted to the processes of knowledge transfer with Dana Silverstein, who will co-host uh, our session uh, today. Um, as you know, in the wider aim of the conference to investigate the uh, terms as uh, uh, a lens to uh, uh, observe the divorce between housing and architectural housing provision and architectural research, as well as a method uh, to address, uh, to rethink um, the, theor the theory of uh, housing uh, today. We decided also to dedicate a session uh, to uh, the role that words terms uh, acquire in the process of transfer of knowledge. We are seeing today through our presentation that it's not only a process of transfer uh, looking that uh, from one uh, cultural linguistic areas to another, but also a process of transfer between different disciplinary fields that show very interesting processes of uh, uh, migration, adaptation, appropriation, and sometimes Sometimes a mistranslation of certain notions. Uh, so we will see today how this process of transfer of knowledge uh, can highlight uh, several vectors and occasions that convey and favor this process of exchange and transfer. But also it's interesting how we will address uh, um, an analysis of the pedagogical uh, value that this transfer of knowledge acquired, looking at how not only the role of architects changed in the provision and production of housing, but also how his formation and his education change, <clears throat> defining very new interesting professional roles. So uh, we will have uh, four uh, speaker today. Um, and I will introduce uh, um, and we'll start uh, the, the first presentation. The terms that we are going to investigate uh, are uh, machine in the garden, generalist, habitat and uh, pedagogy. Um, I will now unshare my screen. What we are going uh, to, to propose is like we, uh, as we did for the previous uh, days, is to have 15 minutes of video recorded presentations. And then we will devote 15 minutes to the discussion uh, related to the specific presentation, to the specific papers. So questions and comments, remarks that uh, directly uh, deal with the presentation presentations contents, while we will have at the end a collective discussion that try to uh, individuate and uh, analyze, discuss uh, concerns that cross all the four presentations. So um, thank you for um, attending the session and I think uh, I will uh, um, we can maybe Dana uh, start uh, to um, frame and to prepare the previous presentation by Abigail Sachs while I introduce her. Uh, Abigail uh, teaches landscape and architectural history and theory, and she studied design uh, professions in the United States. She's working on a project uh, tentatively titled Atelier T a designers in the Great Depression that has the aim to uh, critically analyze the impact that the Tennessee Valley Authority has in the design uh, policies um, in, in the careers also of architects and landscape architects who work for it. Uh, she's working on a book uh, titled uh, Environmental Design, Architecture, Politics and Sciences between 1937 and 1933 that it's forthcoming from the University of Virginia Press. Uh, it's a study that examined the development of the concept of environmental design that is crucial also today for our discussion within the session in architecture 
architecture and its role in the modernization of American architecture. Uh, I would like just to remind her 2009 essay, Marketing Through Research, the William Caudill and the Claudia Roberts Coates that has been published in the Journal of Architecture and was selected uh, for a special issue anthology that uh, comprised the purpose of a Journal of Architecture's most important architects of the decade. So thank you, Abigail, for uh, your contribution. And I think we can start to the presentation. Can everyone say? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nicole Bouzier famously referred to housing as a machine for living. And his designs demonstrate the standards of efficiency and technological innovation this idea implies. He then placed these houses in yet another machine, the city, which he imagined as an extension of the machine for living into infinite space. In American public discourse, however, cities are often viewed as dangerous places, full of rampant capitalism and creeping socialism. This approach is rooted in Thomas Jefferson's ideal of a farmer's republic. In this vision, democratic citizens thrive best in the middle ground between wilderness and civilization, a place where they are challenged by nature, but also free from the inhibitions of the city. In the 19th century, this middle ground was often identified with rural and pastoral landscapes. In the late 19th century, Frederick Jackson Turner developed this trope further by pointing out the significance of the frontier in American history. His theory posited that American culture needed a frontier, needed a place where people battled the wilderness and transformed it into the cultivated land. Pioneers, Turner argued, brought knowledge and technology with them, but left behind the stifling restrictions of civilization. These pioneers were thus best equipped to support a robust democracy. In the late 19th and early 20th century, advocates of both social and environmental reform drew on these ideas, and many progressive proposals sought to place Americans in what I suggest we think of as frontier gardens, the tamed but still challenging loneliness. Being on the land, these progressives assumed, would develop the requisite democratic character. That this democracy was racially limited subjugating African-Americans to Jim Crow segregation and Native Americans to physical and cultural decimation was either justified with social Darwinism or simply ignored in the early 20th century. The return to the land was not a nostalgic yearning. Life on the real frontier was rough and housing primitive. The middle ground, progress, the middle ground progressive envision, on the other hand, was to be created with resources and technology. Leo Marx calls this the pastoral ideal and shows how it was rooted in the notion that the machine supports and enhances nature. Marx's seminal book, The Machine in the Garden, outlines the ways in which these two metaphors intertwined in American literature. Borrowing from Marx, I suggested in this cultural context Progressive American architects sought, even if unconsciously, to design not only machines for living, but also a machine in the garden. By the time Turner published his theory of American culture, the frontier he described was closed. Settlers of European origin had made their way to the Pacific and had tamed much of the continent's wilderness. In the early 20th century, however, this Rhetoric was transferred to new geographies, which were recognized as the new frontiers. These included the Tennessee Valley, where many residents still lived in primitive conditions. Their houses, as can be seen in the image, were roughly made homes that offered few comforts. They did not have running water or electricity, the walls lacked insulation, and the floors were often swept earth. Progressive discussions of social and environmental reform coalesced around the concept of regional planning. This theory was first proposed by Patrick Geddes in Scotland, 
and given diagrammatic form by Englishman Ebenezer Howard in his proposal for garden cities. Regional planning, however, was developed further after it was transferred across the pond. In the 1920s, members of the Regional Planning Association of America, the RPAA, connected between garden cities and the complex notion of the pastoral ideal. Based on these discussions, they imagined a region dotted with garden city, <coughs> forest, scattered industries, and park for parks for recreation, all as rationally and technologically organized as Le Corbusier's city. RPAA members strive to construct demonstrations of their vision, such as the garden city named Bradville, New Jersey, but these were limited in number and size. The Great Depression, however, expanded the scope dramatically. The legislation enacted by Frederick Delano Roosevelt in his first 100 year days as president, known as the New Deal, took progressive rhetoric and gave it a legal mandate, giving its proponents the opportunity to plan and design the visions which they had discussed in the previous decades. The largest and most ambitious of these legal entities was the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, established in May 1933. The TVA Act outlined a series of large-scale engineering projects to transform the Tennessee Valley frontier. First was taming the Wild River and preventing the yearly flooding that devastated lives and crops. This problem was addressed with a system of dams along the river, river and its tributaries, which still controls the flow of water in the Tennessee today. A second project looked to the land. Decades of small plot farming had reduced much of the soil in the region to dust, causing bad erosion and loss of sustenance. Using persuasion and demonstration, the authorities slowly changed practice, our, our farming practices in the valley. The final project derived from the first. The dams built for flood control were also used to produce electricity, and the TVA was charged with rural electrification, building the system that would bring these power to the farmhouses, improving their material comfort dramatically. With the TVA board of directors, this work was a new kind of pioneering, I'm using their terms. And indeed, the project was rooted in a large scale version of the transfer of knowledge and technology described by German. Professionals of all stripes swarmed into the valley, intent on modernizing the region and making it into another prosperous and democratic frontier garden. Among these professionals were a group of talented and progressive architects who were responsible for housing the TVA employees and rethinking the primitive houses in the region. In the first two decades of the TVA's operation, that is between 1933 and 1953, these architects worked on multiple projects, responding both to the TVA's needs and to the changing conditions as Europe and then the United States entered World War II. Working in a stable institution, they had multiple opportunities to grapple with what I am calling the machine in the garden. They did not use this term. But the houses they designed and constructed are each an illustration of the term I am proposing. The architect's first machine in the garden were designed for Norris, Tennessee, a model town based on the garden city diagram. Well built with excellent insulation, running water, and in most cases, electricity. These homes offered modern amenities as well as private rooms and indoor plumbing. At the same time, each house was individually sited in the town so that its residents could benefit from the natural surroundings and could plant both flower and vegetable gardens. The Norris houses were built for TVA employees who were the only ones who could rent them. The architects, however, extended the machine rationale to the farmhouses in the region. Working with the Tennessee Extension Service, they produced pamphlets explaining how to mechanize a house, as you can see in the image, and urged Valley residents to implement such renovations. 
They also spent time in the field assisting residents who had to move because of the rising water in the reservoirs, with the goal of making sure that the houses to which they relocated would indeed be machines in the garden. The Norris houses were good examples of the architect's ideal, but they were expensive. As the TVA continued building dams and power lines, the architects had to contend with housing thousands of workers who moved from one project to another as they were completed. In response, they developed what they called temporary housing, low cost houses that could be rented cheaply. These houses, however, also followed the machine in the garden model. Made with newly invented materials, such as fiberboard, called homosote, they still offered the amenities of the Norris house, insulation, water, and electricity. They were also carefully sited within the construction camps so as to take advantage of the incomparable mountain environment. When World War II began in Europe, the United States entered into a defense economy and the TVA expanded their operations so as to produce more electricity to support it. This expansion allowed the architects to continue experimenting with housing solutions. They took some of the houses they had designed and physically moved them from one dam site to another, carefully placing them in the new context. Here we have the machine for living, quite literally moving from one garden to another, sometimes by boat, sometimes by truck. Moving houses resolved immediate housing needs, but they did not live up to the standards of a machine for living. The TVA architects looked to remedy this condition by developing what they called demountable housing, more widely referred to as prefabricated houses. When the US did enter World War II, the need for temporary housing skyrocketed. Working for the federal government on defense housing, the TVA architects further refined the house machine make it even easier to locate in new garden settings. Working in the field of demountable housing also brought the TVA architects in contact with commercial manufacturers of trailer homes, which were used in TVA construction camps during the war. They soon set about revising this basic house to fit their more complex expectations. The homes they designed and built represented both the best of both worlds. They acted as perfect machines and could be located anywhere in the now developed new frontier. The TVA prefabric houses, prefabricated houses no longer exist, but in some ways the architect's attention to the machine in the garden lives on. In developing the houses, the architects also developed a sectional approach to prefabrication. Each house was built in the factory and then traveled to the garden site in sections rather than as components. This system is still the basis for manufacturing houses in the region, and thus the Tennessee Valley continues to be dotted by machines, both practically and figuratively. As already mentioned, the machine in the garden is itself a transfer. I borrowed it from Leo Marx and applied it to the housing of the TVA. Doing so has allowed me to capture the interactions of other transfers as well. First, the travel of the idea of the frontier to new environments in the 20th century. Second, the travel of theories, in this case regional planning, from Europe to the United States and its adaptation there. Third, the transfer of knowledge from construction centers to the periphery, in this case, the Tennessee Valley. And finally, of course, the development of the idea of transferring houses from one garden site to another. With so many meanings, machine in the garden cannot but be more a metaphor than a description. But then housing is such a complex phenomenon that it can hardly be captured with anything else.
Thank you, Abigail. I really appreciate the way you use the, the metaphor uh, of uh, the machine in the garden uh, to investigate the, its translation also in uh, houses and projects by the TVA, where housing really became uh, the places of uh, the encounter and interaction between expertise, uh, architectural culture, technological research, and the local environment. So there are a lot of uh, possible uh, um, lines of discussion related to the transfer in your paper and I really like you because it's a good opening for uh, our um, I want to thank you because it's really a good opening for our debate about uh, how transfer forms of transfer can be questioned I would have a question but uh, I would like before uh, to ask uh, if there are uh, uh, questions and uh, comments remarks uh, um, from the participants. It's too early in the morning. Are there any questions, <laughs> <laughs> remarks? If not, I, I will start with mine. Okay, so maybe I can just uh, um, open the discussion. Uh, I, in the several transfers that uh, you, um, I, directions of transfer that you highlighted, uh, I think there is a level of transfer that is very interesting uh, that uh, highlight uh, the movement, uh, the flow, the migration of knowledge uh, between an idea that was really rooted in the 19th century more in general in the American intellectual uh, culture that is uh, uh, related to the tension between uh, the natural and uh, the technology. Uh, so I wanted, uh, uh, you reinterpreted it using uh, Leo Marx in uh, analyzing uh, the, the case of the Tennessee Valley Authority. So I wanted to know if you think that uh, in the, the New Deal programs, uh, in the notions used uh, in the programs of the Tenet Valley Authority, there is a still a legacy of this tension between nature and technology, or uh, we have uh, a different forms of interaction? Oh, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, I think the Tennessee Valley was such a big institution. I mean, literally thousands of people. And there were quite a lot of people who were um, uh, leading it and there were different opinions um, between them. So I think that answering about the TVA is not the right way, but rather to say that I think there were two different approaches. Um, and the first was that you take care of the natural, gar you take care of nature and you take care of, and you do that with the machine. In other words, those two come together, you create a mechanized landscape and out of that social change will come as well. And, and that, of course, was much easier to define, much easier to say, this is what we're doing, this is what we're not doing. And then another group, and most of the architects were in the second group, had a more complex look at it, of what the machine was vis-a-vis -vis people, what the machine was vis-a-vis -vis nature. So they mostly accepted um, the idea that nature and, and people needed machines. It, this was very much a technocratic, um, mm -hmm. Uh, institution, but they also represented, in my opinion, a small group who kind of said, wait a minute, there are things that are beyond the machine. There are things about human culture and about human nature um, that, that we can't mechanize. And um, I'm, I'm literally currently finishing up the manuscript for the book, which I'm sorry, I sent you the wrong <laughs> bio. The, the new title is The Garden and the Machine. Um, and, and part of the argument is that, um, that they were sort of the bastion of, wait a minute, we can't mechanize everything. We can't bring it all together in this larger institution that really truly believed that, you know, if you just think about it rationally enough, then, then you'll get there. <laughs> Yeah. Is there evidence of the use of the notion of machine in the garden in the programs for the TVA houses? No, the machine in the garden, uh, Leo, Marx, Marx proposes this much later. So yeah. this is the 1960s idea. Um, so this, this is me building in, um, what I've been trying to do is sort of look at what the architects were doing across multiple realms, not just in housing. 
and um, you know, if you have a few yeah. hours, I can tell you more, but I won't. No, 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 no. I want to open because I really like it also the way you arrive to the notion of garden in the machine that totally question and problematize the direction of transfer yeah. and uh, the fact that it's not a li not linear process, but uh, really a multiple uh, directional trajectory. I think that was especially true for the architects who on the one hand, were very much part of the institution, part of the TVA, and on the other hand, constantly had other ideas and other things, which is where the title Atelier TVA came from, which is was the working title for a long time. Thank you. There is a question, Sharon, you can pose your question, I think. Yeah, please do, I can't yeah, read, yeah, read it's it at the moment. <laughs> it's, it's too early for me to be on camera, but um, <laughs> I'll just, <laughs> sorry. I was very organized the last few mornings, not so much today. Um, so I'm curious, Abigail, about a specific piece. Um, the people who were removed from, had to, had to move their homes because of the dams, you showed the one plan of a house that the TVA suggested, this is something you could build for yourself. Yeah. Um, and because the houses that the TVA built were just for the workers, not for the people who are being displaced, um, can you talk a little bit more about the process of sort of self-building or the housing that was created for those people who had to move and how impactful the TVA's notions might have been on the valley? Oh yeah, <laughs> another great question, thank you. Um, the thing is the TVA personnel were very, very committed to the idea of democracy. And of course, what that meant is as complicated as what technology and what garden and what all those things meant. But one of the main implications of it was that you don't make decisions for other people unless you're making them temporarily when you're offering them work. In other words, at no point did the TVA actually build things for local residents. That would have gone against um, their attitude towards what they were doing. They were, however, um, very involved in helping people. So in other words, they had, um, it was actually, they actually worked through a, the local extension, the agricultural extension of the University of Tennessee. And people from the extension would go and meet with families and discuss with them and, and um, talk with them and sometimes even help them move their things and so on. So in other words, it was very much what the families wanted rather than the other way around. Some families simply took the money and moved to wherever they wanted to move and you know, had nothing to do with the TVA after that. Um, what I was pointing out, so, so these, pe and these people had been building their own houses for generations. <laughs> that, you know, the, uh, the knowledge to build a simple shack is it's, it's actually still very much part of the area here. Almost everyone I know can build something in an afternoon. Um, it, took me, it took me quite a few years to get used to that. What the TVA was especially interested in, however, was to make sure that these houses would live up to their standards of hygiene and privacy and electricity. Um, so the idea that you need a living room that you don't sleep in, that you need private rooms for people, that the bathroom should be separate, all sorts of bourgeoisie ideas that weren't necessarily shared by people in the region. And they were especially, because uh, electricity was one of the main things they were doing. In fact, to many Americans, they were an electrification project. That's the, that's the way they were thought of. Um, they really wanted people to use electricity. Um, they also needed people to use electricity because otherwise they couldn't sell the electricity that they were making. So there was a consumer <laughs> capitalist part of it as well. But they really also truly believed that living with electricity would give people um, the opportunity for a better life, would free women to do other things, not necessarily um, you know, in the men's world, but certainly free them a bit, would give, um, would, would just would allow people to take vacations, would just give them a better life. So all of this is to say that what they emphasized was not so much building for people, but transferring knowledge. Again, coming back to the topic of this, um, of this conversation. Um, and so what I showed you were drawings of how, not actually how to build a house, but how to electrify it. In other words, if you're going to put electricity in, this is the most rational way. And there were also, there was also a lot of information about how to build a house, including um, plans, designs. You could buy, you could buy information about the houses that TVA built for a nominal sum. 
you know, for a dollar or so, you could get a set of plans that you could then use. But it was never, um, I'm not building it for you. I'm giving you as much knowledge as you need. And if you need, I'll even hold your hand while you're doing it, but it's your responsibility to build the house. And it's very hard for me, you know, I, I struggled with, I've been struggling with this for quite a while to be able to say how much of an impact that has had. Certainly people in this area no longer live in shacks. <laughs> and electricity is no longer a surprising thing, but there is some very interesting, what in any other place you'd call um, vernacular or sort of self-build housing around here. And people will put up with things that, um, I, that you don't see in bigger centers um, in a very, and sometimes in very beautiful and interesting ways. And sometimes in ways that, um, you know, uh, make our students go and try and make a change. So in, in other words, the knowledge went into the region, but only so far. I hope I answered that. <laughs> there is a question by Yael. You can ask Yael, I think, also the question directly. To yeah, Abigail. okay. So thank you, Abigail, for this. Thank you, Abigail, for this beautifully layout, uh, laid out um, paper. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate on TVA, TVA housing as an expert designed object, of course, relating to your former project versus the area's traditions and versus TVA focus on the water and engineering systems. So why was expert attention given to housing to begin with? And was knowledge transfer uh, conducted via inhabiting it? Was housing in a way a machine of modernization and learning to become part of a modernized um, uh, landscape? I think to really um, address that question, I, I have to look at it in three different ways. And there are probably more that we could talk about, but <laughs> three for now. The first is you have to remember that these architects um, and landscape architects, but um, we're focusing here more on the architects, are working within a very technocratic um, institution in which having knowledge, having expert knowledge is the key. That's how people were um, employed by the TVA. That's what the TVA talks about all the time. So for the architects to be able to say, we have knowledge about housing is very important for their status within the TVA. And that's part of what I've been sort of following, how working within such a large institution shapes how they think about um, what they're doing. And one side part of this, um, which I don't have time to go into today, is that they start describing some of what they do as research. In other words, they really try to place themselves amongst the engineers and the scientists and so on. Now, for them, this is, a, uh, for architects in the United States in this period, it's a really interesting point in time because um, it's quite clear by now that they're not going to continue to be the sort of cultural elite that architects were in the 19th century. They do have to change, but they're not quite sure yet where they're going. So they're familiar with modernist ideas from Europe, but they're not absolutely sure that they fit in the United States. The machine in the garden is one example. And so they're actually, uh, what they're doing in, in the TVA is using it as an opportunity to, to sort of define what their expertise is, define what it is that they know. And a lot of what they do is, is public, um, not let's say publish, but they write report after report about here's what we learned about housing. Here's what we learned about housing. Here's what we learned about housing. Now, now we know it. So that's, that's, I think the most important part of the answer is that they're trying to live up to something which the engineers already have, or at least people think that the engineers have. And um, it's very hard for them to let loose from that and say, no, we were, were designers. Um, though some of them do that all the time. The second thing is that they need to um, house the people for the TVA. To make the TVA project work, you had to have a workforce. And that workforce had to be comfortable <laughs> and had to be able to work. So it's, it's, in other words, the second part of this is a very technical answer of, they have thousands of people and they need to move around across an enormous area. Um, I think that um, the Tennessee Valley is compared to, to, the, to Great Britain, okay? So they're moving these people over two decades all across this thing. The question of how to house them is, is very much an expert question because you can't do it um, one by one. <laughs> 
And then the third thing I'd say is that for all the fact that they respect people in the valley and they are looking forward to making them into um, sort of productive citizens of the United States, they don't see them as there yet. In other words, there certainly is um, not quite colonial, but maybe internal colonial. There certainly is a class issue, a it's, it's very, very complicated. It gets into issues of race. It gets into issues of which are, you know, very wide, but there certainly is a paternalism and a feeling that we have knowledge about housing and that we can teach you something about good life. Um, that is not just the TVA people. It's shared by a lot of different groups across the region and across the United States at the time. I mean, even just this idea that you have to have a living room that you don't sleep in. Um, seems to me like just the perfect example of, you know, why? <laughs> because it's different, you know, there were arguments and, and we could have a discussion about it, but for them, this was a given, like that you need to design a house where people won't sleep in the living room. <laughs> so every time I read about that, I want to go sleep in my living room just, <laughs> just so as to make the point. <laughs> so. but people were living in farmhouses that were just a string of rooms you know, one room leading to another, people would sleep in lots of different places, bathrooms would be outside, would be outhouses. In other words, what they're bringing in does require a lot more knowledge and a lot more expertise. Whether it's necessarily better is another conversation, but it's certainly something else. Let's put it that way. Thank you. I think this, uh, I, uh, I would uh, proceed and uh, introduce uh, the, say, if you agree. Oh, if Monica had a question? Oh, um, sorry, because I was checking the chat, of course. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I hope I said your name right. <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, Abigail, thank you very much for your really nice uh, presentation. I'm just curious maybe, uh, about, you show about um, uh, the image that you showed uh, from Howard's, Howard's diagram about the Garden City. Yes. Uh, and I'm curious about if, uh, if there was any translation about uh, the infra infrastructural relation of, of this, um, of this Garden City, yeah. if you can call it like that, or in a more, uh, planning level or in a more urban level, if there was any relation specifically in terms of communication? Um, yes, that's that's a story in and of itself. Um, to, to put it very bluntly and leaving out some of the edges that were more complex, um, um, the Americans who were interested in this topic, um, the RPAA, the Regional Planning Association of America, looked at this diagram and, um, and saw it as a diagram, not just for how you place the city in a, in a place, but actually how you think of an entire region. And so, um, so yes, they're certainly taking it there. They talk about garden cities all the time. Norris is intended to be a garden city. Um, I think one can make the argument that they go one step further and say, this is really what a region should look like with this infrastructure and so on. So they're being quite literal about the diagram. Um, and and, and what, I should, what I should emphasize is that these people and a lot of Americans at the time and a lot of Americans to this day um, don't see the city as the place to go to. <laughs> the question is how to organize the rural landscape um, and the tensions about that, you know, we, we still have them to this day. <laughs> I mean, they, they played out on national news and international news last week. It's a, so um, in other words, they're not really thinking of it, should the city be this way, but rather should the world be this way? And their answer is yes. Um, their goal all the time is small communities where people know each other and can support each other and can be self-sufficient. That's sort of the frontier garden that I didn't go into, but that's sort of their idea. And Garden City, if you take it and break it down into smaller garden cities, not the size that Howard is proposing, but something much, much smaller, really describes what it is that they want. Be glad to talk about that more later, <laughs> if, if there's time. <laughs> if there are not other specific questions for Abigail, I think, yes, we can uh, then at the end, uh, in the, during the collective. Well, I, 
discussion to come back to some very interesting points that were highlighted by Abigail. And I think this uh, conclusion uh, before, uh, through also Yael uh, questions uh, on the educational purposes uh, of, uh, of the program that took shape through different levels, with so not only introducing architectural models, but also to providing uh, an expertise and now hope for to build the houses, but also to shape mode of inhabiting and ha habits uh, that I think it's a very important uh, levels that uh, we can discuss maybe at the end. So this educational project introduced also <laughs> very well our next uh, um, speech, our, our next presentation uh, by, um, by Monica. Uh, Sorry. I want briefly to introduce uh, Monica, who is an architect uh, and uh, has a uh, in housing and uh, urbanism and uh, has a master in housing and urban history at the Architectural Association. She's assistant professor of the Department of Architecture and Urbanism now at the ICSTEC in Lisbon since 2004 and uh, joined the AA Visiting Teachers Program in 2015. Her research focus on uh, architectural education and its uh, geographical translation and uh, she has recently uh, been invited as a, a guest uh, editor of the issue uh, of uh, AAE Charette Global Practices Transnational Pedag Pedag Pedagogies. Sorry. Uh, she's a member and researcher of uh, Dynamia Set and she participated in the international program Housing for the Biggest Number, Lisbon, Duan, de Macau and the Coast to Coast Latest Infrastructural Development in former Portuguese uh, Africa, Angola and Mozambique through an historical critical analysis and post-colonial assessment. She is now involved in the middle class mass housing project and in 2016 she started developed a new investigation as visiting researcher fellow at the Bartlett UCLA on the history of the Department of Development and Tropical Studies at the Architectural Association. So through the analysis of its heritage and the transnational networks expertise in the Global South, she's investigating uh, and trying to provide a critical reading of uh, some uh, pre-established system of knowledge transfer in post-colonial architecture. Okay, so I think we can uh, introduce the presentation. Housing has been always addressed within context of crisis. Both in developed and underdeveloped countries, whatever their nature and scale, bringing to the fore its wider political impact. In the early days of development planning, economists, political scientists, sociologists, and anthropologists predominated according to political agendas. The lexicon related to it changed accordingly, as well as the actors called upon to intervene. The coexistence of a growing number of different fields of expertise in an increasingly popular arena under the concept of multidisciplinarity might have impacted on one another, shifting or weakening discourses. In fact, despite for centuries the provision of shelter has been claimed to architecture, its tools for reasoning, especially when facing extreme situations, have come to be seen as quasi relevant, as one might deduce from the almost absence of the word architecture or design from central debates. This leaves the professional in a critical position between the ethical and the aesthetical, the political engaged and the apolitical. Does the architecture of housing as a cultural product go beyond the built artifact per se and therefore calls for another professional? In the aftermath of World War II, the progressive dismantling of previous power nations and the independence of many countries have contributed to new political, economic and technical processes, as well as to highly mobile flows of people and ideas. With the rise of international aid agencies, economic and social cooperation, housing became central to debates on development, human rights and democracy, segregation and inequality. The role and power of international development cooperation and humanitarian aid attracted prominent experts to the global south where the situation of housing was more critical, channeling knowledge flows outside mainstream geopolitical frameworks allowing a fertile ground for discussion and experimentation in those countries, with alternative agendas to previous hegemonic systems. As soon as the United Nations was established and the right to adequate housing included within the Universal Declaration on Human Rights in 1948, 
it became an important lab and transnational network hub with a new centrality, crossing the paths of Americans working in the field, worldwide SIAM members, and expert representatives of emerging nations, mostly from the global south. In 1954, the United Nations sent to the Gold Coast, an English protectorate, a transnational team on a technical assistance administration housing mission to advise the government on questions of housing policy. They produced an extensive report, out of which came a recommendation specifically focused on education to establish a school of architecture and planning as soon as possible, since there were none in the country. The goal was the training of a general practitioner, a new professional to respond paradoxically to urgent specialized needs in housing. One decade later, in the oldest school of architecture in England, the recently appointed Dean, in his inaugural speech, stated that to face the world challenges, the architect had to be a generalist. This paper aims to inscribe the case study within a larger narrative of how disciplinary disputes and demands for more scientific methodological approaches to housing, as a response to a changing society, imply the reconceptualization of the architect. Its examination can highlight the changing role of architecture in the process of housing in the past half a century. In the process of readjustment, certain translations were paradigmatic of blurring meanings and boundaries affecting the architect's repertoire and devices and the, the gradual despecialization of housing. In the early 1950s, there were different networks addressing housing issues from different perspectives and focus. CM was demanding the right to adequate housing for the great number, while also having a theoretical debate around the ubiquity of the word habitat and its efficacious to translate the diversity of concerns related to it and into a charter. In the United States, Gropius defended that the CM should enlarge its members to American professionals and broaden its, by, its base by inviting figures active in planning and housing. At the same time, Different power nations were promoting more techno-scientific approaches to their overseas territories and protectorates. The UN called for an ongoing international exchange on, of technical experiences and expertise on housing and planning issues, joining South and North hemispheres as part of, of a larger agenda of helping the emergence of a single world culture. It was established the program of, on housing, building, and town planning within the Department of Social Affairs, which evolved into the UN's expanded program of technical assistance. In an early experts mission in Asia, the team found many alternative and unknown research stations, but also the lack of skilled personnel and the need for university training for planners. They argued the UN should have an important role providing technical assistance to the creation of professional training facilities to address the problem. When the UN went to the Gold Coast, the country was undergoing major infrastructural interventions and housing was very critical. The Volta River Dam and Power Station, whose resultant lake would be one of the largest in the world, was to provoke an enormous environment and social impact and the need to displace a large number of populations. Other projects included the port and railing tema. The appointed experts were Charles Abrams, Vladimir Bodjansky, and Otto Kornsberger. The team embodied the, the idealization of international cooperation between peoples, nations, and individuals, representing different philosophies on specific tasks that the UN sought to achieve. The three were all into the CM UN network, had different and complementary fields of expertise, different geographical experiences, and symbolically represented different power nations. Abrams, the chair, was a Polish-American urban planner, at the time one of the leading authorities on housing in the US, already at the heart of the UN, particularly regarding land problems and policies. Wodjanski was a Russian-French engineer with an early career working with the French government in Congo highways, a vast experience during the 40s in planning and building in Morocco, dealing with issues of mass migration from rural areas, and was one of the founders of Atba Afrique. 
Kronzberger, the German architect, was a recognized specialist on housing issues from his vast experience in India, particularly in town planning, resettlement, and rehousing as director of housing for the Ministry of Health of the federal government in New Delhi and as housing advisor for the government of Burma. This got him the housing and town planning consultancy for the Volta River Project Preparatory Commission. The two-month mission started in October 1954. They visited almost every district of the territory, traveling about 70,000 kilometers and interviewing officials as well as countless other person, including chiefs and elders of the people, builders, businessmen, tenants of property, and ordinary citizens. On their return, an extensive report was submitted with introductory studies such as the country's rural and urban growth and the impact of a transitional political, economic, social, and land context. It defined targets and needs and covered a wide variety of topics from which housing policies were dependent of administration, finance, education, and construction. Each was deepened in separated appendixes. Appendix E was devoted to technical education and its importance was central as it contained the main underlying strategy for success of all others on the mid and long terms. As the author stated, the best housing policy and the most careful construction program could not be put into effect unless the country had the necessary technical personnel. After the government's approval of the proposed new school, it should be developed a detailed syllabus and requir requirements through the appointment of a two-man expert committee to draft all the arrangements in the shortest possible time. However, the mission went far beyond suggesting technical training. They proposed to create a new profession of competent general practitioners, ideally following the model of medicine, with generalists and specialists. The proposal was justified by the shortage of qualified manpower, as it would be unrealistic otherwise, especially in a country where it would take years to train the first professionals. The few formally trained in Europe or United States would not be enough for many years to come, and that was a luxury that no developing country could afford. The general practitioners should therefore be highly recognized professionals, men who know enough planning to choose sites for development, survey them and prepare simple plans for town extensions or village development, men who know enough of architecture to design and construct residential houses, schools and other simple public buildings, men who know enough of quantity surveying and accounting to prepare estimates and value properties, men who know enough of municipal engineering to cope with village roads, wheels, trains, and other tasks of this nature, and enough of administration and law to be able put to put their own projects into press. While still in the Gold Coast as housing advisor, Kronzberger started immediately to lobby for the fathering of the new school and establishing institutional contacts. This proved to be not an easy task. There's, there was a strong UK network that was not only responsible for the most important commissions in the British Empire, but also in charge for the local research, usually the building research centers, and the approval of architectural education through the RIVA Overseas Relations Committee and Commonwealth Association of Architects. After some turmoil caused by Kronzberger's proposal and by who should advise whom, who should be the consultants, the exact shape of the course and therefore the professional, by November 1955, the names for the follow-up missions were defined. Professor Matheson from Manchester and Garden Madwin, Professor of Architecture and Civic Design at the University of Liverpool. The first would advise on matters of academic administration, university constitution, and possible institutional relationships. The second on questions more related with teaching. By the time, Konzberger had also managed contacts with the local academic institutions, and the principal of the University of Science and Technology at Kamazi was already interested in opening it in their campus. Meanwhile, the committee met in Kamasi and produced the proposal to be included in Kornsberger's second report, who had returned to the country as housing coordinator in accordance with the recommendations made by the regional mission. 
Apparently, either they did not totally agree with, on the general practitioner concept, or during the process it became clear that the establishment of a new school would be politically determined by the professional standard of the UK and the maintenance of the level of dependency from RIVA. Therefore, they did not follow the recommendation and instead proposed a composite four-year course with the common splitting in the last three years, leading to different degrees, architecture, town planning, and building technologies. Nevertheless, the ideological agenda of technical assistance to recently independent countries shifting from exporting experts to advise existing agencies to tackle the education problem through the establishment of local higher education and therefore addressing the housing issues on a longer term was already in March, but on a different stand. Eventually, the School of Architecture and Town Planning opened its doors in 1958 in Kamazi. Shortly after, it was established the Building Research Group on the recommendation of a United Nations Technical Assistance to undertake research in cooperation with the Buildings and Rose Research Institute into better methods for meeting human housing needs in Ghana. In 1960, the government requested advice through the UN Technical Assistant Administration on how to increase supply of qualified planners and what arrangements should be made to relate this need to other manpower requirements in its development process. Peter Overlander from the University of British Columbia went there and recommended the establishment of an Institute of Community Planning attached to the University of Science and Technology at Kemazi but alternative to the Department of Town and Country Planning. Its aim was the training of planning assistants, described again using medicine as a parallel. While other academic programs are aiming at training doctors, the Institute in Ghana is training medical orderlies, stretcher bearers, or perhaps nurses. In 1963, the situation of the school was very critical, and the authorities were considering closing it down. An agreement was then made to associate it with the Architectural Association in London, where the Department of Tropical Studies was led by Konsberger at the time. He personally changed John Lloyd, a former AA First Year Master, to take over the position of Dean to reorganize the course and to expand, expand its capacity so as to provide the manpower for all the professional levels needed in the building industry in Ghana. Lloyd redesigned the curriculum based in life programs, convinced that schools should become important research centers to contribute to the country's advancement. He intended that vital areas such as housing had little to do with architecture as conventionally understood but a great deal to do with politics, economics, population, and social studies. During this period, he initiated the occasional reports meant to disseminate the school's work, covering subjects such as rural resettlement, low-cost housing and building techniques, rural and regional service, geodesics, social building organization, etc. The faculty was a major participant in the Volta River Resettlement Program, responsible for the census of 85,000 population, social survey and analysis, the regional plan for the Volta Lake catchment area, and the selection of the new town sites, among many other projects. Lloyd stayed in Ghana until the military coup d'etat forced him to return to London alongside another opportunity as AA principal. At the inaugural address, great emphasis was given to the world's social, economical and health crisis. He redesigned the curriculum to a unit system that was not only to affect the vertical relation in place between the design courses, but also the entire network constellations of disciplines, shifting it a much more evident focus on the design process so as to prepare students for a range of definition of the architect's role, including industrial design, landscape design, and planning. He decided to involve students with real problems and urgent areas of crisis, absorbing life tasks, therefore making a contribution to advancement of the society as a whole, as he had done with his students in Ghana. Lloyd described the school 
aims in, in its educational policy in the principal commons in the school handbook one to produce generalists. Lloyd's generalists meant a variety of modes of operation that he called attitude field in diverse contexts, the application field translated into a three-dimensional curricular model. While the attitude field was that of the original general practitioner, the application field was considerably expanded, questioning the general trend towards the compartmentalization of knowledge within physical disciplines. Both the general practitioner and generalist, despite having the same roots, represent different trajectories of inquiry, but both challenge a line between housing specialists and housing specializations, and in the, the process, it's despecialization. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, for <clears throat> the extremely challenging presentation that add uh, very interesting elements, I think, uh, on the ground of our discussion uh, today, uh, because uh, I, I think uh, in this uh, intense uh, uh, moment uh, of uh, creation of new networks of a translational knowledge of uh, global experts and expertise that we have in the span of time when you investigated, you were able also to look at this transfer of knowledge from uh, the a knowledge that established a discourse uh, to the local context. And I think introduced very also um, interesting uh, elements of connection and relation with our next uh, presentation. Uh, I just wanted to highlight two points that uh, are uh, relevant for our discussion uh, today. Uh, I think that uh, we tried to uh, introduce in our discussion in the previous uh, days uh, a lot was on several occasions uh, the, 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 the debate about uh, uh, the emergency of a new professional role over different moments of the 20th century of architects that uh, are interested in housing uh, design and uh, the difficulties in designating him also in find a name and uh, a definition for him from Hauser uh, to a wider uh, um, generalistic definition and the, your paper I think not only highlights that aspect in a very interesting way to understand uh, how in this moment can be defined and, and to question the definition but also add another element that it's related to how these uh, architects these new professional roles are formed so which is the pedagogical project which is the educational frame the curricula that can uh, in this moment that you analyze but in many other uh, moments that were debated of during the session during this conference that can form this uh, professional role. So I think found this uh, really interesting because we have this different level, the definition, but also the, the, the tentative to create a pedagogical project and a formative project that can frame the education of this uh, ambiguous and undefined uh, profile. So I don't want to, to, to <laughs> spend time with other comments. I want to open the discussion. I think there are already questions. I invite you just to switch on your camera following the order. Uh, so Abigail and then Giovanni, and we can uh, pose to Monica our questions. Please, Abigail. There we go. <laughs> Monica, thank you. That, that was fascinating. Um, and no, I, I, think, I think it's very important to talk about pedagogy as, as a way of, of carrying ideas and knowledge forward. This may be outside what you've already researched, but I was curious if, um, if there was a backlash in Ghana to this idea of the expert. It certainly happened in the United States in the late 50s and especially in the 60s, the idea that the expert knows. And I'm curious if that was translated to, to the context you were looking at as well. Um, I'm not sure if I, if I understood um, if I understood your question. No, no, that gladly. Um, I think that what I was describing with the TVA and what you're describing right after the war is this idea of an infallible expert, someone who really knows, who can bring the knowledge. And at least in the American context, by the 1960s, there's a big backlash to it and a lot of questioning about whether this really works. And I'm just wondering if that happened in Ghana as well. And if you haven't gotten to that point in time, that's okay too. 
Well, uh, in fact, the uh, what happened in Ghana was um, exactly, uh, well, it started exactly with the opposite. There was no manpower at all. There was no schools. Uh, so uh, the, the few people working in Ghana were coming from um, basically from England. Um, mm -hmm. And so this was basically what um, uh, what was the starting point for uh, for this uh, for this proposal uh, that these few people working in Ghana wouldn't uh, wouldn't be able to solve the housing problem, uh, and that's why uh, the team proposes this uh, new professional uh, that would be able to concentrate a lot of different professions in one person and. In that sense, they they were uh, aspiring that uh, it would be faster uh, to uh, to solve the problem. Kornsberger used to say that the housing problem in the global south was a problem of numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was different from the north. Let's put it like that because it was a problem of numbers. Um, so. And this is this was the interesting paradox that, uh, in a way, they wanted to to train this uh, practitioner, uh, this general practitioner. But on the other hand, this was uh, in fact a highly specialized person because he had to concentrate so many uh, knowledge uh, and so many professionals, uh, so many professions in just one person. Um, so. In, in fact, this, uh, these guys were uh, the first uh, pro professionals coming out were uh, demanding uh, more money and uh, higher <laughs> status <laughs> in the academic uh, <laughs> level, etc. Um, but uh, I think it was uh, probably I, I'm not uh, I'm not aware of the American situation, but I think it was uh, the opposite. Yeah, no, in the, in the United States too, there was first a celebration of expertise and then a backlash. And, and that may be not in the period that you're looking at. I was just curious about the parallels. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question by Giovanni. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you, Monica, for your presentation. It was really fascinating. Uh, I wanted to ask you if when mm, talking about the construction of the program of the, of the new school uh, in your um, research could you find any crossroads with the trajectories of uh, with biographic trajectories of other kind of experts i mean you are being uh, outlining uh, outlining um, the figure of experts coming from the architectural slash planning realm going towards these General, uh, generalist dimension. Um, you had, did you have the chance to see if there were any specific uh, sociologists or um, I would say anthropologists or other kind of, uh, of social scientists involved? Um. Well, uh, in in the in the original missions, uh, no, uh, there were no. Uh, uh, not not those kind of experts in the in the beginning, um, but um, but there were um, and not and not in the design uh, not in the design of the of the of the course. Um, but that was that all, that was also a political problem because uh, because the the river had to be uh, engaged with it. So, I mean. That's a different problem from the philosophical idea of the school. So that's why uh, of what the mission intended to, to be. So there, there were political constraints. Um, so that's why it ended up being uh, not uh, exactly like they, they shaped. But uh, in terms of, um, of experts, there were many experts uh, from, different, um, from different fields and when um, from when uh, when John Lloyd uh, took over the course, and when he was um, when he was um, uh, the dean at the university, uh, in fact the the university was not um, was not uh, run only by architects. There were sociologists. There there were um, a lot of anthropologists. In fact, he. Um, uh, he ended up with history, uh, with the, all the history courses, 
So there was anthropology was very important uh, and uh, African culture uh, and things like that. So it was a completely different uh, course. Um, and um, yeah, it was, uh, there were very many different areas of expertise rather than architecture and sociology and anthropology definitely were very important. I don't know if I asked uh, if you want particular names, but I can give you later. Yeah, sure, that, that for sure. I, I was just interested in, uh, in the level of cross disciplinarity that was reached in the end by this project, and, uh, just to understand whether it had got to the point, to, his, uh, to, the point uh, to its purpose or not, or whether he had, it had some, uh, I don't know, some sidetracking or failures in between, so no, it's okay. Thank you. In fact, it was um, very much um, one, of, one of the first projects, and I find this very, very interesting, uh, was um, uh, with, um, with a village uh, that, was, um, that was having um, a, very, uh, a very strong disease, uh, which is called high, uh, can't, I can't remember the name, but it's something that it's blind um blind uh, river blindness something like that and so they started to work uh with these um villagers um to um in fact to provide uh, a new place for them to live in and basically they were working uh with the villagers um uh and also with um the people uh, sociologists and anthropologists but also um, the, the political institutions uh, in Ghana uh, to work uh, to work um, to work that out, but mainly doing a, a lot of surveys. Surveys was something that was very important. So it's, it was not designed in the usual sense of the word. And the um, the Kamazi reports that I showed you I, that I showed just the covers. I, well, the drawings are very different than the usual. I can also show you later or by email or something like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Monica. I was also wondering if in this wider moment uh, of redefinition of housing research that include ethnographical research, social sciences, the contribution of geographers, this was reflected in the curricula of the school. So it was uh, interesting. Uh, I would like to know if there are other questions for Monica from uh, the May I? May I? Of course. Of course. Okay. Hello. Hello, Monica. Uh, so congratulations for our presentation. It was really very, very, very good. Uh, so I know a little of your work, but I think now we are in a, a very challenging um, moment. And I have more or less, it's two questions, very practical questions that I, I really would like to, to know a little more about it. And the first one is the, the level of um, uh, achievement of the men, the, the former students trained in, in the school. Do you know if they really you know, were able to, to, uh, to practice this new expertise in field. So what was the level of achievement of these men after Lloyd uh, left, uh, left Ghana? What happened to these, uh, to these um, uh, people, to these former students? And if in so how the, 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 the curricula or the course continued in other um, ways, in other uh, framework or, or something like that. And then the second, um, question is related to it. I think very very important idea that these European men who go to Africa to use Africa as a kind of a, a experimental field and then return to Europe again with these all new ideas to change the curriculum of schools. When Lloyd returned to London and returned to the school and he tried to and he comes you, you put this um, this newspaper saying that he has radical ideas. What really happened to his radical ideas when he returned? Did he was able to form a, a body of, of, of new um, architects uh, embodied with this kind of new ideas that he had tested in, 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 in Ghana, or you know just Europe just you know just uh, mitigate he, his aspirations to change? So it's basically this, and I really 
enjoyed your presentation, Monica. Very good. Thank you. Um, in, uh, well, I didn't have I didn't have time in, uh, to to show it in this presentation, but in fact, uh, in the original very long paper that I sent to Gaia, <laughs> uh, I had uh, something about it um, because um, what what happened to Lloyd uh, when he went to the Architectural Association? So he stayed there for as dean for a few years, but there was also uh, political problems because the Architectural Association was going bankrupt. Uh, but other than that, um, he was uh, considered not only a radical, but all, he was also on the newspapers as an anarchist and um, uh, things like that. So he was much more than that. So the curricular, he, he really changed the curricula at the AA. Uh, so in fact, he started the unit system, um, which usually uh, people um, uh, coin it to some to to Boyarsky, which is not true. Uh, Lloyd did it um, before him, and so he changed the all curricula at the Architectural Association, so the students could pick up everything they want uh, in 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 this um, in this uh, within this idea of the application field and the attitude field. So they could do everything they want. So therefore, this anarchist title. Um, so in the end, uh, he was out of the school <laughs> and, and Boyarsky took over uh, his position. Uh, and, but in fact, he didn't change it that much. He, he took his ideas of the unit system and uh, reorganized it in, in a way um, that uh, it still prevails until our days. Um, but, um, on, on the other things that uh, that are important that that you were asking, in fact, um, Lloyd was asked uh, to take over uh, schools in other places um, in England as well, uh, and he did uh, uh, and the, and he took over these ideas uh, in these places and also saved another school from from closing in England. He was also called uh, for the opening of the school in Costa Rica the first school in Costa Rica as a mentor uh, of the school, the first school. So, I mean, there was a, 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 a um, cross world um, transfer and rethinking and rechanging of this um, idea, which is very interesting going from, um, because he also, he also taught uh, in Norway. So from England to Norway, from Ghana, to England, so to to Costa Rica, and um, so I, this is fascinating the way he was uh, changing about the students from Ghana. This is also something very interesting because many students went uh, afterwards uh, to do um, specialization in uh, in the tropical department at the AA, and the other way around, the tropical department students went to Ghana uh, to be professors there. So there's, there was also this, uh, but then there was at the, in Ghana, there were also many teachers from abroad. And I, I mean, Bookminster Fuller was teaching there for a while. Jane Drew was there for a while. Um, Doc Siadis was consultant at Tema. So he was also, so there was like a crossing path of many people. Um, and uh, also, um, many uh, Eastern Bloc architects, um, et cetera. I'm well, sorry. I, could, I could continue, but I can't, so. Yes, I think we can, sure, it's really interesting. We can continue in the last part uh, because there are a lot of interaction with the next uh, paper. Uh, uh, so while uh, you were investigating these, uh, uh, let's say cultural context uh, through a pedagogical project uh, and uh, through, um, the definition of new curricula related to the role of uh, architect involved in housing design. Uh, the next presentation will focus on a term, a word, uh, observing how this word habitat will convey um, the transfer of values and knowledge, also looking at the transatlantic transfer between Europe, United States, and other geographies. So I will briefly introduce, then if there are other questions, 
questions for uh, Miguel and Monica. We will have time in the final uh, um, discussion. Uh, I will uh, briefly um, introduce uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Giovanni Comoglio. He's an architect. He's uh, trained uh, in uh, Turin and uh, Paris, and he's now a teaching assistant at Politecnico di Milano. Uh, he was a former research fellow at Politecnico di Torino, and he is a contributor of Domus magazine and uh, Il Manifesto. Uh, he held the PhD in History of Architecture and Urban Planning uh, at uh, the Politecnico di Torino, uh, where uh, he investigated uh, through an historical theoretical research the concept of habitat uh, through the contemporary architecture. Uh, and he has operated as well in the fields uh, of uh, curatorship and contemporary of our contemporary architecture as resident architect at the Frank Centre Val de Loire of Orléans. Okay. Stop housing, think habitat. In architectural field, habitat has always been a critical concept in itself. To introduce habitat within the architectural debate is an act of critique of housing. After World War II, the possibility, the need for a solution is recorded for a world left destroyed, largely homeless, holding the sole certainty of the failures of modern. A solution to be at the same time practical, some way moral and epistemological. Habitat is a word that conveys different meanings and actions, a word generating words, attitudes and gestures in architecture, different meanings with operational effects that will be explored here. That has in fact been the generating point for my research that has moved through a vast and differentiated set of sources to follow the evolution of the notion of habitat through different contexts, both geographic and cultural. Through an evolutionary trajectory that was made possible by a complex network of connections, bridges through research and practice embodied by places, the debate arenas, and by people, some specific bridge characters that enabled that migration and expansion of knowledge that can cast a unifying light on an apparently uneven phase of contemporary architectural history. By reading the history encompassing the 50s and the 70s through the construction of a concept of habitat for architectural disciplines, it becomes possible for a critic to call him or herself out of the modern postmodern dichotomy, thus understanding an historical period that will be otherwise very hard to interpret with just one single style-based semantic and historiographic tool. It was in fact still quite hard to find a clear historiography concerning an evolution of habitat thinking in a specific field of architecture, as it is to find any universal interpretation of architectural habitat from one language to the other. There are many reasons for that. Basically, because of the incremental nature of habitat concept. As post-war history goes on, habitat as a word keeps on incrementally enriching its meaning. Then, because its appearance and evolution are a metaphor and a symbol of a radical redefinition of actors and scale of the design process. Then, because it embodies at the same time an opening, an evolution in the twilight for the power of the figure of the architect. In a chronological perspective, the period of bewilderment and search for alternatives in the aftermath of the last great collective narration in architecture and urbanism, as I said, the modern, is a time where it's very hard to find a language system suitably conveying and consolidating new concepts and cohesion. In the CM context, at the Congrès International d'Architecture Moderne, the habitat appears as an instrument to criticize the Athens Charter, despite being presented sometimes as its natural evolution. The Le Corbusier led Ascaral French group, originally the promoter of the Athens Charter, 
promotes the shared construction of a world as a sense-making condenser for the design and dwelling. In 1949, a commission is added to the Congress program at CM7 in Bergamo, devoted to the study of a Charte de l'Habitat, a habitat charter. Habitat was nonetheless highlighting the divergent trajectories springing from within the modern architectural realm, from the work and reflection of CM members themselves, while they attempt to define univocally the word habitat at the meeting in Zigtuna in Sweden in 1952 could find no success, different meanings would somehow undercombine or clash at the CM9 in 1953 in Aix-en-Provence, from the plus grand nombre concept by French groups, to the general and achieved attempts to make habitat a matter of coding. No charter of habitat will be ever signed at the CM. Different trajectories were already taking their shape at the same time. Non-colonial approaches, such as the work of Michel Ecouchard and the Atbat group developed in 1954 <clears throat> for the northern expansion of Casablanca in the, by then, French protectorate of Morocco, was characterized by the matching of a matrix, a structure made of horizontal and vertical patio house settlements with the urban to rural life transition of new habitants. And influence of the such experience could be found, found in the following settlement projects in France. Was that still a motherland? Then the drawn manifesto called the Statement on Habitat. The founding act of Team Tang also penned in 1954, and the first radical cut into the CM discourse is built on the definition of a parameter of analysis and design for modern cities, basically identified with a relational element. The scale of association illustrated in the manifesto recenter an entire set of parameters on the possibility of social interaction and on quality of relational experience in the, of the individual, thus permitting to define a city as human scaled or not, as a city or not. A real alternative in methodology of architectural research is introduced. Making habitat is reversing the traditional researcher object binomial as well as traditional Eurocentered, West centered cultural balances by enabling our architectural research to reach a global scale. The foundation of early 60s debate on Forum, it's in the Forum magazine, it's itself generated by such a non colonial trajectory. In those years, Aldo Van Eyck, Forum editor, carries out a groundbreaking research on the Nigerian Dogon population, temporarily becoming an ethno-anthropologist and identifying in some typical forms of association and occupation of both built and open space, some basic principles to operate on the connection between transformation of space and human relationships between form and practices. The relational elements led back to a, re a reconsideration and redefinition of individual, of that man for whom and on whose measure the design process is conceived. It becomes the priority of architectural debate. In 1959, on Forum magazine, the short circuit between philosophical reframing and design research appears on the scene thanks to the direct intervention of a philosopher in a properly architectural discussion. Das Problem des Menschen is Martin Buber's contribution to Aldo Van Eyck's reflection. Project is not aiming anymore to an imposition of visions or narrations. Architectural projects should concentrate on the goal of providing structures, platform for the development of society, as something going through a process of construction and already providing the implicit materials of its existence and its dynamic. It's present in the end. The possibility to act and interact is that by that point identified in the opportunity to connect knowledge and power at both official and unofficial levels. Subjects by the time are acting on this scenario and featuring a double nature. They are both individual players and debate arenas where the where questions pour until they create a proper subject somehow made by or made of themselves. 
In fact, as the CM group disbands, a conceptual creature named Habitat remains homeless and suspended, and not by accident, the obligation to grow it up is divided between subjects of this kind. Habitat is exported at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, directed by Josep Luis Sert, through the action and research of Jacqueline Turbitt, the former CM secretary. There, it will meet a totally new research concerning the scale of design of cities, soon labeled urban design. It will also end up in parallel in the Dallas Symposia Arena, ruled by Konstantinos Doxiaris in the early 60s, and it was already in the um, structure and the action of the newborn United Nations. To step back to towards the urban design approach, urban design approach could merge around the conceptual focus of human scale, the US-based reflections with the legacy of some more European and siam related ones. In this case, human scale as an instrument to bring a revolution in thinking and action draws its definition from the reflections carried out since the 40s as a response to large-scale infrastructure urbanism perceived as inhuman in great American metropolises and actions and different actions and reflections, such as the work and activist action of Jane Jacobs. The result of such merging is so peculiar that urban design, targeting that intermediate scale where humans spent most of their lives, became a kind of a trademark. Architects will acquire more and more the status of a network node, a work of intertwining and joining together different rationalities and disciplines. And the architects find themselves more and more engaged in designing such interaction. This new way of debating and networking can be embodied by echistics, etymologically connected to the word habitat, the science of human settlements conceived after World War II by Greek architect and theoretician Konstantinos Doxiaris, and by the Delos Symposia that had the purpose to yearly reunite around issues of a globalization, settlement, and planning practices the most different kind of characters. The symposia, though claiming once again for the goal of drafting a final charter, are substantially temporary think tanks where one could find Richard Buckminster Fuller, Margaret Mead, Marshall McLuhan, Jean Gautman, together with the UN officers such as Barbara Ward or four foundation executives such as David Bell, punctuating the team with influential historians such as Siegfried Gideon or Arnold Toynbee. Altogether, engaged for first time in an interdisciplinary exchange on every aspect contributing to a revolution in designing the relationship between the human settlements, as we can see from the schemes, and man as planner, social, individual, and inhabitant, as these schemes drafted uh, during the meetings can show, and the environment. The relevance of such meetings structured on the network as both a, a procedural and design figures as Richard Buckminster Fuller will do by reinterpreting the, the planisphere of the world as a, as a network, and we can see, as we can see here, had a relevance also to geopolitical scale. And that was the reason why they became part of the research of powerful founders and um, political players, such as the Ford Foundation, within their global worldwide research on the urbanization phenomenon. This transition will be finally accomplished as a transition towards the semantic and political realm of rights as soon as Habitat debarks in the context of the United Nations action. The creation of the UN Habitat Division in 1978 shows how habitat has always been both the signal and the result of complex processes of theoretical and practical repositioning. But this happened as the merging of the pre-existing center for housing, building and planning of the UN Economical and Social Council 
with the work and people from the UNEP, the UN Unit for Environmental Policies, responsible for the organization of the Stockholm Conference in 1972, still a symbolic guiding light for the thinking on sustainable development. The UN HBP, from now on, was born in 1948, together with the UN, as a structure for supporting to the reconstruction and gradually evolved towards an orienting action for planning and settlement policies in member countries, but most of all in the, development, in the developing countries. At the time, a totally new definition corresponding and at the same time criticizing the idea of the third world. The main instrument for promoting such activities was, was the Housing and Town and Country Planning Bulletin issued from 1948, a real witness of the progressive construction of theoretical and practical contents of this mission. As an immediate capacity for operative intervention was acquired, a consequent priority was to access previously consolidated contents and methodologies. And this was one of the main factors which determined the construction of a network of both UN consultants and officers coming from the architectural debate of those decades. This construction of an international mission for planning mirrored, therefore, the aforementioned circulation of people and ideas and at the transatlantic and global scale. Several CIAM members, many involved in urban design reflections at our GSD as well, signed contributions to the bulletin. Walter Gropius, CERT, Jacqueline Turbitt, Anna Weisman, the unit director. This action had already been the base for the extension of the network that we are talking about. In 1954, the meeting promoted by the UN in Delhi was the occasion for Jack Turvid and Siegfried Gideon, participated as CM uh, representatives, to get involved with uh, Constantinos Doxiadis, thus strengthening the link uh, with acoustics as, as a player of such, uh, of such network of migration of knowledge and practices. When dealing with the urban scale, focusing as focusing on urban reconstruction, on post-war reconstruction, the founding unit of an urban system was retrieved in the modern movement debate, mainly focused on techniques and requirements and tools. Thus, interpreted as a, as a tool, the neighborhood unit made, it, made its first appearance between the priority topics at the UN. In the first issue of the bulletin, Hans Weisman drew the first direction of the UN HBP on the track of reconstruction in uh, Europe and industrialization as a solution. And Catherine Bauer, architect and Harvard lecturer, identified the Nibiru unit concept as a good set of principles to be considered and applied. Still, a second vocation of the bulletin was the will for a global action influencing in planning activities. And that transposed the reflection in the complex osmosis between Western world and ex-colonies or the upcoming third world, which characterized the post-war globalization of modern. In that precise cultural and operational context, the relational component once again became the reason for involving different disciplines into the planning debate. Architecture started taking into account beyond the words of construction, such as the petite habitation individuelle that was still envisioned for the tropics, the words of social design also at a worldwide scale. The concept of neighborhood unit was not sufficient in its original formulation anymore, and it was somewhat, somehow disassembled and assimilated into wider reflections, generating concepts which quickly grew intersectional and interdisciplinary emerging politics, anthropology, environmental and social studies, again into the notion of the habitat. The founding act for UN Habitat was finally the Habitat One Conference held in 1976 in Vancouver, where the ritual of an achieved transfiguration of a merging of questions on housing, building, development and environment is celebrated. In an atmosphere joining the institutional vocation of a diplomatic international meeting with hopeful integrative expressions of a forum totally animated by NGOs. The goal of the conference is to mark this achieved metamorphosis by drafting a declaration, once again, the Vancouver Declaration of Human Settlements that is by then the status of a charter for the rights of man, considered this time as inhabitant. Here, a wide range of different instances converge 
encompassing all the efforts of critique against the Athens Charter, as well as some reflections that are actually still connected to that bygone context. There is the example of the Habitat Bill of Rights that took part to that debate. It was still Siam flavored. It was developed by Sert, Josep Luis Sert, formerly with uh, Moshe Safdi and others, in programmatic points, originally aiming to define a minimum technical benchmark of inhabitants' rights to be proposed in Iran in the late 70s. Politics and dwelling, theories and practice, official institution with, with NGOs and informal networks, the will to break cultural structures of modern with an irresistible drive for manifestos, diplomats with architects and environmental, social and economic scientists, all of this merges into a charter once again. And once again, the contents are less important than the, than the iconic quality of their process of reconstruction. A process where a multitude of relatively new players, besides debating the meeting agenda, questions themselves and their position on the new global arena, characterizing a new era. And at the same time, start making moves on that checkerboard while trying to solve this question. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Giovanni, for uh, this uh, really fascinating uh, track that uh, crossed uh, many of the moments uh, we analyzed before with a very diverse uh, perspective. What I found interesting in the presentation is how habitat can be really investigated as a container of meanings and uh, how in its movement uh, from different cultural and linguistic context uh, in relation to different usages and significance uh, we have uh, uh, the, the implementation of a new debate. Uh, so um, I think that uh, there is another aspect related to linguistic uh, and, uh, translations and cultural translations. Uh, you, you highlighted how in the Francophone context uh, and in the Anglophone context, uh, the semantic uh, interpretation or the definition of the notion of habitat is totally different and how is interpreted uh, through by architects uh, also in um, the housing, uh, uh, real, I mean, the housing research. I would uh, open uh, the discussion. Uh, I think the trajectories were very interesting and uh, we can uh, see now also from the participants if there are questions, uh, comments, uh, remarks. Abigail, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that, that was fascinating. Um, this is more a comment than a question. Uh, I think we've been talking about expertise and about expertise as paternalistic. And, um, and I just wonder how much Habitat really changed that dynamic. It certainly brought in a lot of new conversations and a lot of, um, completely agree with you, brought in a lot of attention to things that sort of early Siam was not paying attention to. But it still makes it still leaves the Siam people and the people whom you followed, who are traveling across the world, in the place of being the ones making um, you know, making the theory. And um, in some ways, I might again. I'm I'm just doing this for the argument, not because I don't appreciate what you did. Um, but in some ways, um, referring to people as part of a biology. Um, is as paternalistic as referring to them as part of a machine. Sort of throwing that out there. <laughs> mm. uh, sorry, um, if I understood why well, your question, uh, your comment was um, actually uh, how fundamental it could, uh, how fundamental in the end it could be this, uh, this the use of this term in, uh, I would say, in changing anything. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, I should say that it was um, there was a great uh, that, that the habitat uh, debate with the word habitat right kind of flashing in neon lights uh, right upon the entire debate arena was um, the great igniter of it all. It was uh, it was the one to to actually start the entire process. It was, um, it was the it was that kind of um, of attempt to to actually push forward the discussion and the reflection that was 
perceived as, as, as stark after, right after World War, uh, World War II. And yes, I would say that uh, is, I have to say that I agree with you exactly with what you just said, because um, we don't find any, we don't find any great, uh, I don't know, statement or witnessing, um, stating, oh, I'm a, I am an a habitat professional <laughs> before, um, before the, the UN habitat unit is established uh, in late 70s with, as I was showing, completely different purposes. Uh, I'm not, not different, but I would say evo evolved purposes, evolved purposes. Um, what I would say is that uh, in some way it's a, um, it is an interpretation, uh, a framework of interpretation that is um, quite fundamental in understanding how it all started. And it, I would say that it stays in the background of all the different uh, different terms, and all, all the different, um, I would say, kind of a trademark terms that have, uh, that have been uh, labeled in different debates and different, uh, and different um, ways of thinking that have in some way changed the whole thing if uh, when we are talking about uh, sustainable development sustainable development as uh, as stated from uh, for instance uh, 1972 limits of growth the record from the club of rome is um is is in some way Okay, sorry. I'm I'm using in some way because it's uh, some kind of a, of a of a conversational expression, but it's not it's not right at all. It is pushing forward that exact uh, reflection that was started as the as the CM were were disbanding and uh, as the as the CM were um, I would say bringing inside different stimulation for different disciplines. Maybe you don't see the habitat label, but the reflection is the same. It's that one. It's exactly that one, even though, <laughs> even though they just kind of revamped habitat in, uh, in late 70s. I completely agree with you that it changes the discourse in Siam dramatically. That, there's no question. That's for sure. I was just pointing out that the discourse still remains within a small group of people who are traveling around the world and that the general attitude of expertise that we know and we will bring this expertise doesn't change even when the discourse changes. That's all. I, yeah, I, so I just um, want to add, uh, add something I, I think can perfectly depict uh, how in some way this changed things a lot. I just being, uh, I just been having that uh, Ford Foundation cover from uh, the Ford Foundation report popping up uh, for some seconds during the presentation, and as uh, okay, it was um, it was a few people going around traveling around the world and debating. Uh, we, we might say between themselves <laughs> what uh, what the human scale was. Still, um, Ford Foundation was the one of the main funders of, uh, of the Delos Symposia, for instance, that are the exact uh, uh, example, representation of that, kind of, uh, of that kind of meetings. And when it came to uh, deciding whether it was the case or funding uh, uh, or keeping on funding the Delos Symposia or not, um, for foundation reports in, uh, in insider reports um, will state that okay uh, they were a bit uh, they were a bit blunt uh, to, towards the, the the symposia participants but uh, they will say that okay we are not sure they are going to they are going to translate into reality all the things they are talking about still they are um, still they are making great connection they are establishing connection between uh, be between uh, between practitioners between think tanks and between operational institutions so okay guys keep funding so, um, the, um, this is why uh, in some way uh, of course it, it, it is hard to identify that match between the reflection and the action between the few people around uh, the few people on the ship uh, 
cruising towards Delos uh, and signing uh, papers between the torches. And um, there's something that actually happened, but, um, the, but the, from, I would say, I would think that I discovered basically that the interests of, an of, a, of a highly operational institution such as uh, the Ford Foundation uh, stands as a, as, quite a, as quite a demonstration that something was actually influencing something else. It was worth paying. Yeah, you want, of course. Yes. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. This was uh, really fascinating and um, really fits my uh, housing class uh, of this week. So I hope some of my students are here. Um, I have a question that is maybe a continuation of Avigal's uh, question to you. So uh, while I'm, um, I'm, I'm willing to, really willing to accept your argument, your convincing argument, that habitat was uh, um, was a tool, in a sense, in these intergenerational uh, battles over over the legacy of uh, of modern architecture. I would like you to maybe push forward on this and and uh, try to to, to maybe um, uh, flesh out why habitat. So they could have uh, exercised this generational change over many other topics over the city, right? over uh, the, many, um, the many topics brought in by SIAM meetings. And so why via uh, the concept of habitat did the uh, team 10 generational um, uh, shift uh, uh, occur? Why a new manifesto, right? Um, so I think this is important because while I agree with you, I think there's another side to that. Why this specific object was the tool um, for change. Well, uh, well, thank you for your question because I think it's uh, basically it's the, it's the crucial one. Um, and of course, I I had to squeeze in even twenty minutes, not just fifteen. Um, such a lot of uh, such a lot of different trajectories. So, um, in this case, I would say why habitat. I. Well, the, um, there is something that uh, you know, I, I would be really interested in investigating, further investigating, because um, if we think about the, the first appearance of the word habitat within the CM context, uh, that's again Le Corbusier. It's, it's, uh, it's again Le Corbusier. It's, um, it, uh, it is pushed forward by, by the Ascoral group. It's, it's the, I, would, I would say the French conservative group uh, for, in the within the CM context and it's uh, uh, some way trying to trying to keep pieces together after the after the failure of the after it seems failure of the charter of, of agents but that is just how, how the word pops up um, I'm <clears throat> more interested in, uh, in the white habitat for the younger generations because it's exactly um, what I was trying to state at the beginning of my presentation is a different uh, interpretation of the meaning of that word. It's uh, why habitat? Because habitat is, uh, is, is the conceptual tool to criticize those limits, those failures. Uh, why not, uh, we would say, human scale or, um, for instance, human scale is the evolution of the, of the, of the term in the discussion. But, um, I think it's the, is the, as everyone was in search of, uh, I would say a mindset, uh, some conceptual frame to start the discussion, not, uh, not, to, not to just uh, criticize the ongoing uh, debate on single points or uh, single issues or that point of the chat or that one. No, they, the, um, they were in need of a frame, of a general frame to, to push forward the discussion. And um, in this case, Habitat will, will uh, bring into the debate relationships, connections, something that, were, something that was not uh, as um, also Abigail was, uh, was uh, um, arguing in the beginning. Uh, the biological root of the concept uh, is um, the biological of the concept is the one that brings uh, that brings in the, the relational the, the relational element something that was not taken into account in, a, in any statement or manifesto before. 
Uh, there will be another thing I would like to add to this, but I think that <laughs> we are basically um, running out of time. I, I don't know. Maybe in the end, like, uh, I will just add some, uh, some details. Yeah, I wanted to know if there were more questions, uh, specifically uh, to Giovanni that address Giovanni's presentation. Uh, yes. I just have one, um, one uh, I, I think Abita was, uh, when, uh, when Yael was saying that was maybe full of um, uh, joining together generations, I, um, in 1975, uh, it, it was also created the UN Abita and Human Settlements. So I think it was one way of uh, bringing together two different generations. So it's interesting to see that the UN has these two different names, UN and Human Settlements from, from Wequistics. So also bringing together, um, uh, I mean, uh, some uh, uh, kind of uh, more marginal people from Siam and from, uh, from other uh, territories in the world. Uh, and these are probably the Human Settlements part of the title and then the Abita, um, yeah. Abita part of the, um, uh, of the of the name of the uh, of the foundation, and and then the other thing is uh, after Vancouver there was there's also uh, then the magazine, uh, which is called only Abita. Yeah, the, sure. There's one that became uh, Habitat International. Somehow, um, somehow fall. Uh, but interestingly, uh, most of the people that write for uh, that magazine are those. Um, marginal experts uh, and the known marginal experts and one of the uh, one of them and very important director was Konsberger for many many years so you were asking about uh, those if they oh, okay. cross their paths and everything and uh, many of them were also teaching in Ghana so this is something that we can also uh, talk about it uh, later uh, I think we, I, I, I think we, we can have a, a very interesting discussion <laughs> later. Yes, <I> guess. <laughs> yes, I would like. So, if are there other questions from participants uh, who wanted to bring some remarks? If not, I have uh, before. I would like to have a question for Giovanni, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, Giovanni from Portugal. Um, listen, I have a question for you. I, I strongly believe that it will be. Um, quite su suitable in, in this case. You talk about human habitats and as well in the migration of the people around the world. But I'm, my question is on another scale. For instance, we do have in Portugal and in, in Italy and around the world for sure, uh, historic city centers that at, now, at this time is, uh, they are pretty much the, this, um, desert without any, 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 any people inside. Uh, because all the population from the from that region inside the city just moved to uh, more modern urban areas, and my question for you is, in this case of new times of migration, how can we reactivate or reuse uh, the city, the historic city centers, and how can we adapt it uh, to the modern to the modern needs of our society? <laughs> Wow. Uh, well, <laughs> um, I mean, it's quite a <laughs> it's quite a relevant question. But uh, the only thing I, uh, as I cannot, um, of course, be um, stand uh, stand stand up and <laughs> state uh, state something about the way uh, the, the way we are, we are gonna change the world. But um, there is also something that I will. Um, actually like to bring here after after your question uh, because the um, many of uh, the, if there is something that should that could be considered in the um, that could be considered as the um, within the um, within the historical city debate or um, the, the debate on uh, urban heritage as a matter of evolution uh, I would say from a habitat point of view, is that many of the studies and many of the researchers I've been, uh, I've been quoting, I've been, I've been uh, showing here, are moving from that concept that I mentioned 
of the structure. I mean, of, of an interpretation of um, urban settlements and human settlements as basically platforms where, so, where social evolution is taking place. Uh, which is something that uh, I mean, the, the introduction of the of the social point within the, the heritage debate is something that is uh, not evident at all. Not uh, is not taken for granted, and uh, for sure, it's something that was uh, that was brought in, uh, into the debate by um, by let's call it the habitat research. That is just one first thing I'd like to to say as an answer. But I really think that. <laughs> Um, we might we might keep on uh, discussing it maybe by the end of the meeting. Thank ben, you very much. Thank you, thank for you. the question. It is a wide uh, discussion that we can maybe have at the end. I would like just before introducing the next speaker, highlight that uh, uh, the purpose is not maybe to try to propose uh, a balance or to evaluate if these discussions that it's really multifaceted and articulated and cross diverse uh, cultural context and historical moments uh, uh, can uh, be helpful, but rather to show the migration of these notions that it's a container that uh, where that we can use as a lens to understand the relation between housing and architecture and tension between housing and architecture and how it changes when introduced in very different academic institutional um, disciplinary we can say also context in this migration from Europe to the New United States uh, coming back uh, to Greece uh, and then spread of of course, in the frame uh, of uh, uh, what we can uh, define uh, different uh, um, linguistic fields. So I think this is uh, the point uh, and uh, the aspects that highlighted by Abigail in relation to the expert, it's always uh, a, a backbone of our discussion today, because here what it uh, could be interesting to understand the flow, the direction of this transfer. Uh, if it's uh, from uh, disciplinary discourse, academic discourse to the institutional one through its codification, or it's rather something that continuously migrate and move. What it's certain is that uh, the, the panorama showed uh, an institutional uh, discourse and uh, a disciplinary discourse that it's not interwaving in this uh, analysis uh, what habitat that started to be and to assume it also in the common usages. That would be another very interesting uh, uh, field of investigation. Um, okay, so I think that we can introduce uh, now um, the next uh, speaker who is uh, uh, Alice Agostini. Uh, I will want to share uh, her first slide since she has no um, images, so sorry. Okay. Okay, while I introduce uh, her, uh, we can see. her first image. And then uh, um, Dana will, uh, uh, okay. So she is, this is uh, the, um, the title, a new lesson of uh, pedagogy. Uh, and now, sorry, uh, and now I will introduce herself while Dana can uh, open uh, the video recorded presentation. Alice is a PhD student in architectural history at the Sorbonne Université and uh, the UAV School of Venice under the direction of uh, uh, Jean-Baptiste Minard and uh, the architect Mauro Galantino. Uh, since 2017, she's working for the Cité de l'Architecture et du Patrimoine at the Modern and Contemporary Architectural Gallery of Paris, uh, where she is a research assistant under the direction of uh, the conservator Stephanie uh, Cantan Biancalani. Uh, she is collaborating uh, also with the uh, team of architects from the French Ministry of uh, Culture uh, on the project uh, Les Realisations Culturelles, 19, uh, sorry, the, 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 Les Realisations Culturelles, 1945, 19, uh, I think, in France, une architecture du XXIe siècle. 
siècle. Uh, so uh, we can uh, start with the Alice presentation. Completely revolutionized the process of transfer. The French architect Henri Siriani has completely revolutionized the process of transfer of knowledge. At the beginning of his Parisian career, he successfully transferred the teaching received in Peru by adapting it to a new cultural and educational context. Moreover, his architectural practice allowed him during his entire career to carry out a smooth exchange between the school and the office. Sharing this, this knowledge becomes a pedagogical practice extended to the theory of teaching as well as to the practice of design. With new lexicon of pedagogy, Siriani defined a new vocabulary specific to his architecture and suitable for teaching. The use of categories and dictomies helps students to assimilate the architectural language, which passes through the decomposition of the language linked to the modern architecture. From the second post-war, during the period called Reconstruction, the problem of housing, housing crisis is a central subject for French architects. The whole country has to change, following what the State Secretary at the Industrial Production in 1941 declared. All our cities must no longer live as they have done until now. Without discipline, without order, they can no longer develop themselves in chaos and anarchy. France adopts a new way of how to perceive architecture and residential building, as the, same, as the famous example given by Le Corbusier and the modern movement witness. His concept of Cité Radieuse show indeed a revolutionary concept of social housing, more affordable in space and realization cost. The vision of how to live and ultimately of uh, how to build and speak about housing changed too. Nevertheless, the teaching, the teaching of architecture won't have any relevant development until May uh, 1968. At that moment, a proper architectural vocabulary for residential building, especially the lower rent housing that it's called in French, Habitat Loyer Modéré, will be formulated and change the main terms of this architectural type. In this context of renovation, Henri Siriani imposed himself as a central figure with a social vision of architecture that he spread thanks to his pedagogy. Born in Lima in 1936, he attends the Universidad Nacional de Ingeniería under the supervision of a young team, well known as Agrupación Espacio, responsible of the transformation of architecture as a discipline. Before obtaining his diploma, he started to teach as an assistant at the Adolfo Cordoba workshop and learned the vocabulary and concept of international modern architecture. His work as a teacher is accompanied by a generous building production. Thanks to the president of Peru, Fernando Belaunde Thierry, the government invests into innovate social housing and new towns. The most interesting example of his architecture during his years in Lima is the housing complex of San Felipe, that will be described by Belaunde as a site of major importance for the evolution of the contemporary architecture movement in Peru, respond, uh, re responding a new conception, which consists to develop freely the vo volumes on the ground, to produce an implantation or composition, creating space between the building in a general and homogeneous framework. During his formative years, Siriani also emphasized the importance of shared area as well as indoor space and how the opinion of the tenants has to be the core of the housing project. Some architectural elements appear as the piloti, monumentality, or the duality between horizontal and vertical shapes. Both working as an architect for the country and teaching at the same time at the Faculty of Architecture, helps Siriani to develop a specific pedagogy and architectural language 
two components of his work that he will eventually export in Paris to where he moves in 1964. Once in France, uh, he combines teaching and working by the left-wing political and social engage Atelier d'Urbanisme et Architecture until 1982. Here, Siriani formulates a specific vocabulary that he will apply at the Unité Pédagogique, that it's, uh, in English can be translated Pedagogic Unity, from 1968. Thought it's between uh, uh, 1977 and 2002 uh, at the UP8, uh, so it's uh, Unité Pedagogique 8, and within the group UNO, that Siriani finally defi defines the base of his ideology. In any case, the multi multidisciplinarity approach that Siriani learned in the University of Lima and during his work at the AUA, so it's the Atelier d'Urbanisme Architecture, should not be overlooked, as it plays a remarkable role in his formation. Until 1977, Siriani keeps implementing the ability to break the modern language down, reinventing spatial problematics, and introducing graphic and plastic tools. Those elements become the center of a pedagogy that could be summarized in three theological principle, as he declared in 1977. Uh, the first is the reduction of a theme in order to master it. The second point is the inversion of the project process, directing at the creation and manipulation of a personal vocabulary. And the last point is help the students to express himself and discover the individuality of his project. From Siriani point of view, there is not just one architectural vocabulary, but each student can find his own, following the directions showed during the lesson. Individuality is the sense of a school that wants to show to the students how to see himself doing. In order to create a good architect, schools and teachers have to show how to take decisions and provide the skill and device to generate, uh, to generate ideas. This process is called by Siriani le fil conducteur, uh, that it can, can be translated in English, common thread, uh, that it's a kind of first uh, matrix that uh, serves the rest of the project. Indeed, is each architect has to find a continuing motivation and permanent meaning that support his project. The matrix is basically connected to a formal language. The idea and the common thread appear in the final result, where, in the, where the importance of, of a formal vocabulary shows its crucial role. As the talent of an architect is visible from the minimal distance between those two elements, and the, referring to the distance between the result and the proper vocabulary. In this sense, the vocabulary becomes the foundation of each project that won't be just an aesthetic composition, but rather the result of a logical thinking. For Siriani, words are more rational than any other tool, and they should provide a meaning to the uh, architectural form. Housing is clearly the core of this pedagogy. Several exercises let the student learn the complexity of this type of typology, which needs to be improved in order to deliver dignity that will be eventually transferred to the inhabitants. Siriani show the variation of space through many exercises at the one called Logi, during which students have to con commit to create an apartment measuring 10 meters per side. The teacher show the variation of space that an architect could obtain in a very small size. Other exercises are the four logements, which helps to figure out the, the vertical housing, and the 60 logements, which helps the design the residential typology of the bar. Ultimately, the best no exercise remains the, the one that is called 30 meter uh, for 30, which require the, require the student to build up the project, starting for the analysis of the word used. A teaching approach, which often comes up in his classes and which he kept, keeps on, on using at the UPC in uh, Lima nowadays.
Syriani pushes students towards a reappropriation of language, focus on the world that make up modernity, like poles, walls, shadow, light, and incorporate a own uh, know-how. A specific vocabulary is therefore created to teach how to turn social accommodation and the reduced cost into good architecture, like the well-known pièce urbaine, a specific new town shapes that want to generate an architectural identity. The main feature characterizing this concept is monu monumentality, meaning have, having a real urban presence that asserts itself. Siriani is also known for introducing new terms in his archi architecture and pedagogy, often pair of words that are at first glance opposite, total opposite. It's, it is the case of transparent opaque, outside inside, full empty, dynamic static, or typical atypical. The real meaning of those word pairs is to combine them within the building to create an ambivalence and read render the space more sophisticated. With transparency of act, Siriani showed to the students how, to manipulation, how the manipulation of the material can totally transform the perception of a building. Transparency helped the building to be vertical, but at the same time, even, every person needs to feel safe and bound to the ground. This second need is answered by the opacity. This, this concept is noticeable in Netherlands project of a skyscraper. Among them, just one building will be realized, uh, the one located in Den Haag. While San Felipe is probably the actual first project where the concept of Siriani outside inside was applied. Commons area have the same importance that private space as the combination of those two components assure both human connection and the finite define the importance of interaction and the respect of private sphere. This part is probably uh, more influent in Siriani work as he always claims the importance of social architecture. The idea of a full empty is more associated to the idea of uh, space and shape, how the movement has to be represented in residential project to prevent the tenant to be bored or make them feeling to live in a shoes box. In order to ensure it, open space and terrace, common garden and parks have to be a dynamic part of the project. As we can see at Grenoble at the working class district called L'Arlecan. Those examples show how versatility is the real sense of Syrianist work and pedagogy and how architect has to be ready to change his mind according to the project or the situation. Up here around 1980, as an explication for the San Denis housing project, the 3P formula, presence, pertinence, and permanence, perfectly explain the exercise and the couple work, words, as well as the ideal vision of a residential building that Siriani tried to transmit through his teaching. This concept explains how words are the core of an architecture that has to have at least three reasons to exist. During a period of a big public debate, he stated the importance of housing program. In that way, the ultimate scope is what influence a, uh, influence a project. The context, is, the context is history or climate, the program or the politi politics behind it. An architect has to respect th those elements while designing the presence of a building. It is uh, aesthetic and form. Of if those two pattern respect, the architecture become permanent, meaning that citizens identify themselves in the building. They feel an emotional looking while, um, while it, and they will fight for preserving the architecture work and finally respond to need of every human being. As Siriani says, at the end, what we are looking for is to belong to our city or country, to make our own history, we do not consider the ephemeral. Thank you. 
Thank you, Alice, for uh, this uh, interesting presentation that uh, highlighted uh, the role of uh, Syrian as a transnational figure in some way in defining uh, what you call the new lexicon of pedagogy in his uh, pedagogical project where housing uh, had a central role. I would like to ask, uh, since we have uh, 15 minutes for the discussion about Alice papers and then uh, a final uh, discussion that cross uh, the four presentations. Uh, I would like just to open uh, the debate and to ask if there are questions uh, uh, for uh, Alice in relation to her presentation from the participants or uh, the other panelists. Uh, Well, I can start <laughs> to ask a question to Alice, and then uh, if someone wanted to, uh, please uh, just uh, enter in the conversation. Uh, I wanted to know, Alice, something that uh, just a clarification uh, in his uh, uh, in the definition of his new pedagogical project and in his uh, lexicon uh, that you call it, that uh, he's based on all these dichotomy and all these uh, terms, so that uh, I found very interesting and challenging. Uh, how much you can observe uh, the, the legacy of his uh, previous formative experiences and experiences and uh, as a practitioner in Latin America in when he shaped this, uh, uh, inaugurated the new project and uh, how much of this you can find in his activity as a practitioner also in housing in the same moment when he established the program. Uh, so, I thank you for the question. Um, I think the, the real point that uh, it transferred from uh, Latin America to Europe, uh, from Syrian pedagogy, it's uh, more the methodology of uh, the teaching. It's not uh, a proper terms or something like this, because when he teach uh, in Latin America, the beginning of uh, his career, is like uh, less than 30, so it's more an assistant than a teacher. So it's uh, really the concept of uh, a school that works uh, in a vertical way. So all the class are connected. Uh, um, you have, for example, the first year that it's connected with the second, the teacher work together, they are never separated. So this is something that it's, uh, it's very interesting from uh, it's the learning uh, at the beginning. And also uh, there is this vision of uh, tran a transfer from uh, also Europe because uh, in this moment in uh, Lima, uh, the faculty of architecture, it's the only one that exists. You don't have another university that uh, teach uh, architecture. And this faculty it's, uh, was opened by Mario Bianco from Italy. So you already have a transfer from Italy to Peru. And also in a moment, the director that it was also the president, so it's Belaunde, is also the one that uh, opened the first uh, review from, uh, of uh, architecture, that it's uh, El Arquitecto Peruano. So it's the first time that you have a review that translate uh, all the script, uh, all the text from Le Corbusier, the Siam, La Chardatin, so you have all the translation of all these texts about uh, habitation, about pedagogy in a review. So it's more like the context than a specific term or a specific way to teach. Uh, so you see this um, multidisciplinarity, this vision of transfer and connect with other, other part of the world uh, of architecture that uh, he learn and he teach then uh, in uh, Paris because when he arrived, they, they don't have the, the revolution, the changing of unity pedagogic. It's arrived uh, four years, then he arrived. So at the beginning, it's just work in agency. He doesn't speak very well uh, French. So he is still learning how to teach what he, what he knows. And um, so when there is the revolution of uh, the unity pedagogic, he can really uh, show to the other teachers what is an atelier vertical? So it's a vertical uh, teaching that it's connect uh, all the participants of the school uh, with the group that he built uh, with the other uh, teachers of the UP8. So they, they create a real group that work all together, that they share um, tools, they share 
vision of architecture and before it was not like this so before for example in the school of architecture you have one teacher for five years or every year it's disconnected so you don't have a connection between the the teaching so this is something that it's come from uh, latin america but it's not uh, like just from latin america it's a general vision that uh, import in paris when he start to teach at the unit pedagogy Giovanni, and Abigail, okay. <laughs> Please, Abigail, and then we move to Giovanni. I, I was just curious how long uh, this pedagogy lasted. Um, did it continue even after he stopped teaching there, or was it something that was very much dependent on, on sort of the people who were there at that particular time? Uh, it teach uh, in France, it teach uh, during 30 years. So it's quite long. Uh, before he, well, he teach in Peru just a few years or two years. And then he, when he stopped to, uh, to teach in France, it's because he has uh, some problem with the team of teaching. So it was not because he wanted, he really, it was not depending about him, but it's more about the connection with all the others. So after six years, more or less, he started to teach again in Lima. So this is also interesting because, um, uh, one time I was speaking with him and he, 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 he explained me that uh, the fact uh, that it's very strange is that uh, the real um, things that it was difficult for him is, was to transfer the pedagogy from France to Lima. So it was not the opposite side because actually we, we expect that uh, it, were, it was more uh, um, easy for him to have a pedagogy in Lima because he's from there, but actually the pedagogy it's really became from France. So he has to translate everything from France to Lima. So it's also very complicated about language because uh, it, he learns some terms about pedagogy, how to teach in French, even if he's uh, Spanish. Uh, so it's interesting to see how we translate it. And uh, it's also a, a bit a challenge because uh, it's not the same culture. So the point is that in France, you have a more general culture about architecture that you don't have in Lima. So also all the idea of habitation, it's uh, very different because uh, in Paris at uh, 68, in 1968, you have a really revolutionary vision that uh, didn't appear in Lima. So the real revolution in Lima was the, at the beginning, before that he started to teach. And it, it's like a stop it. They never had another revolution then. So now he's trying to have the same uh, thing that he does in 68 in, uh, in Lima. And so it's a bit complicated, but he's still teaching uh, in Lima actually. And in France, the school that he taught in, did they continue doing his, using his pedagogy after he left or did they change it? Uh, they continue, but just the, the, um, the architect that uh, learn with him. So it's uh, all the students learn this uh, pedagogy and they still use it. But uh, you don't, it's not part of the system. You, it's not um, generalized. You have some architect that use it and not uh, the one do it. Yeah, that happens so often with pedagogy of how do you, how do you make it continue beyond individuals is a really, really difficult question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Giovanni, you had the question. No, I think there was Monica before. <clears throat> That's okay. Doesn't matter. Okay. Um, well, I just, I was curious because, well, in another life before, before my PhD, uh, when graduating, I have been uh, researching the, the history of uh, the Institut du Monde Arabe uh, in Paris and uh, we are actually uh, Rissiriani took part to the to the consultation for the uh, for the project, and there, were, there was quite a quite a chance for me to to learn something about the context of of the change of a of point of point of view and uh, and mindset on architecture during um, the late seventies and early eighties in, uh, in France. So when moving from the from the Giscard d'Estaing presidency towards the the socialist year in France. So, um, as you were talking about um, what uh, Siriani brought in France, uh, did you learn something about uh, actually what was the influence uh, of uh, what was the influence of the of the of the French architectural debate on him? 
um, instead. Uh, was he influenced more from the from uh, the idea of reacting to the context of the 70s or receiving the 80s or um, okay uh, well you i think uh, yeah uh, i think the what he learned in france from architect and pedagogy it's uh, more or less uh, uh, during this, this period of uh, atelier d'urbanisme and architecture Very so well. it's because uh, in in this moment all the architects that work with, with him uh, more or less teach at the university so uh, the true stronger pedagogy is from Siriani and Shemetov, so Paul Shemetov, and uh, they they are very different because uh, Siriani it's more about the term, the language, and uh, Shemetov it's more about uh, how to build. So I think there is a general uh, um, influence that it's become more about how to work for teach because uh, in this period, the architect works work, work also with uh, landscape design, social, sociology. So it's a multidisciplinary vision that he learned and he teach uh, in this pedagogy, but it's not about uh, one architect. I think it, it's like a, a general vision, a general way to work that mm -hmm. uh, he can apply at the community pedagogy. Okay, thank you. Monica, I don't want to... Just um, a curiosity, Alice, because probably you were going through um, Siriani's biography, and I, I was curious um, if, if there was any um, intertwining between her East pedagogy and, and John Turner, because he was, he was there uh, in Peru between um, 57 and 65, so in, during his... Uh, formative years, I think, and, and the starting of uh, this uh, working period. And I was just wondering if you, if you ever asked, because you, I understood that you interviewed him. And, right? Sorry, I didn't listen the last. Uh, I, I understood that you, you, spoke with, we, you spoke with him directly. And yeah, I, yeah, yeah. We actually, uh, because I, I, I went with him in Peru. We, now we live uh, half uh, of the year in Peru. So when you go in Peru, I go with him. So we, we know we know each other. Um, I think he doesn't have a figure in Peru. I was just curious. Yeah, well, uh, about the about Turner, I think it was more about uh, Belaunde. And um, it's not his generation. I mean, he keep this influence from the generation between be, before him. So, well, this uh, influence that he has in general influence, but they they never met. They never they never he never spoke with uh, me directly about a direct influence with this. So, well, I think it was more general in Peru in this moment. Are there other questions for Alice? I don't know our French friends <laughs> who are <laughs> attending the, the session if you want to, to have some remarks or comments. Okay, so if there are not uh, specific questions, uh, I have one more for Alice, and then I would like to dedicate this last uh, half an hour to the well, well, to the collective discussion. That was part of the question I posed you before, Alice, uh, just uh, to bring uh, back to the, the general discourse of the session. Um, how much of this new lexicon that it's based uh, on uh, these very interesting dichotomies and certain categories that it's codified in his uh, uh, program um, is translated uh, in uh, his projects. So how much we can uh, find in terms of special translation in the project that he designed as a practitioner, thinking in housing. Yeah, actually in uh, the his housing project, you have always, uh, the dictum is always translated. So uh, you work at more about uh, period. So for example, the first period is, is the pièce urbaine. So it's the first project that he made uh, by himself uh, with a, it's a personal project. So, and you find all the dictum is actually, you find outside, inside, because um, he create, for example, a, a private street, but uh, it's connected with all the terrace of the, uh, of the housing. So all the housing have a terrace that uh, look on the street 
So the outside and inside, it's very connected. And for example, they start to work about uh, with the um, terrace in uh, steps. So you have, for example, the people that uh, live downstairs that see uh, the people up. So you have this connection outside, inside, and private, uh, um, or, um, for and not private, actually. So you have, for example, uh, they can share um, the private open space, but uh, they stay private. So you always have these two parts. Um, the opacity and, and transparency, it's uh, later because it's uh, from uh, the project in Netherlands, so it's uh, uh, late 80s. And so it's a project that he never built because actually the, uh, the, the only one that it built is the small one. So it's not really a skyscraper, but you work about this uh, idea of uh, transparency opacity. For example, uh, from outside, it's uh, really opaque. Uh, opaque. Uh, you, don't, you cannot see anything, but inside you have uh, all the um, uh, shared area, like the steps or the lift. Uh, it's uh, open on the on the window of uh, each apartment, so you can see from the steps inside of the house. And but this, for example, I, I think it was uh, possible just because it's in Netherlands. So in Netherlands, they have a vision of uh, living very different than uh, France. If you do something like this in France, it cannot be accepted. So well, it's not so easy after you have another one that it's a uh, typical atypical that it's very important for him but uh, it's more fair about museum or opera uh, so he invented it uh, for the opera house uh, uh, project that he doesn't win but uh, it's invented for it and uh, so you cannot find all in function of the project for example you have some uh, dictomies that you find just from houses and others just for um, uh, equipment so it's depending about the project but it's also for example invent uh, la pièce urbaine and you have another one that it's uh, the parisian villa so he create like a typology of housing it's just not just one uh, typology you have more than one and inside you have the dictomies so it's quite com complex uh, he tried to teach uh, during the pedagogy this uh, from the world so i try to explain this uh, in the presentation um, actually, during all the class that he has, um, he starts from a word, for example, the student, the student has to, to decide a word, to choose a word that it can be modern or uh, it can be something really not connected with uh, architecture. And so from this, he has to develop dictomies or uh, um, to use a, part, a specific uh, element of architecture that it can be light, but he has to explain what <coughs> Before. So it's uh, very connected with vocabulary. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification because I found uh, this uh, idea to transfer what happened in the pedagogical project uh, in, in this category and dictum in operational tools, uh, uh, then as a general uh, uh, comments and remark, very interesting in this process of transfer also that we are uh, uh, discussing. Um, okay, so uh, if there are not uh, uh, other specific questions for Alice, I would like uh, just uh, to open a wider discussion on the thematic, the main uh, discourses that emerged through this uh, four presentation that uh, I think found uh, uh, fantastic points uh, of uh, interaction. Uh, first, uh, in uh, highlighting how much the educational <laughs> purposes of the experiences that we are investigated are relevant in our discussion uh, today. Uh, in the frame of this conference uh, and is an aspect that uh, has not been addressed at the directly uh, from other sessions. So I think that emerged a very, very interesting set of uh, um, educational programs explicitated through the pedagogical project or not explicitated, like in the case uh, that uh, Abigail was showing uh, through the programs. Uh, of the, so uh, on the other, the second point that maybe we can discuss and I would pose to all the four panelists uh, is uh, about the directions of transfer. It's something that we already discussed before. Uh, it emerges a very interesting uh, uh, zigzag connection that put in discussion our idea of linear uh, 
uh, direction uh, of a transfer or unidirection, but see continuously a process of transfer from one reality to another, from a geography to another. And so this trajectory, I think, also help us uh, to problematize in some way, to question uh, our idea of uh, transfer uh, through vectors, because I think it's something that uh, it's definitely more nuanced. And uh, I remember the, the theory of mirrors that uh, uh, Pancho Lierno used to describe and to question the relation between center and periphery. So how we can uh, question uh, this idea when you have one uh, model, one vector, and then through the mirrors can multiply the, in order to understand the processes of the adaptation and hybridization of certain discourses. So this is something that I would like uh, to ask to all the panelists. Uh, yes, Avigaj, of course. I just wanted to share, it's just kind of ironic that actually my project came out of a study of pedagogy. So I was interested in American architects after World War II and what they were teaching, um, something very much like Monica, what you were doing in, in Ghana, but just in the American context. And they kept on saying, we learned to do that in the New Deal. We learned to do that in the New Deal. And I was curious, was that really what they learned to do in the New Deal? Which is how I got interested in the TVA and what the architects were doing there. Just to say that even this project, the pedagogy, I think, is a key word when it comes to knowledge transfer, um, that even this project fits in, even though it may not have been clear this morning. So. Well, no, thank you, because uh, uh, and, you know, the roots of the project uh, and uh, through the TVA programs uh, emerged uh, as an outcome of uh, this interest for pedagogy. That's, that's what I think happened, is that, as I said, architects during the 1930s, and 1940s are really rethinking who they are. They're bringing housing in, they're exposed to housing. And as all of you have been pointing out, they're exposed to sociology, they're exposed to psychology, to um, new materials, to a lot of different things. Um, and then, um, and, and in the TVA, because it's a, um, a institution that is very robust and continues working even through the war, they have a real opportunity to sort of think through how these two things together. And they come to a lot of the conclusions that, that we've been talking about, about interdisciplinarity, about the need to collaborate between different groups and so on. And then after the war, a lot of architects in the United States just sort of fall back on, we, we're, we're going to be architects, we're going to be modernists now and not Beaux-Arts, but we'll be architects. But there's a whole group of progressive architects who coming out of this experience say, how do we turn this into pedagogy so that it outlives us? That, that's why I was asking the question to Alice, because that I'm not saying that they managed, but it troubled them very, very much. And so to me, the term environmental design, at least the way I understand it, comes out of this discourse, comes out of the discussion, biological discussion and relational discussion that Giovanni was mentioning and ties into this question of how do we take this um, experience of interdisciplinarity, of collaboration, of thinking about architecture more widely to include housing and make it part of what architects actually learn. And so they make changes at Berkeley, at Harvard, at Cornell, at uh, Michigan, and in lots of other schools. Um, and eventually, at least in my, in, you know, from, from what I see, you know, in the 60s, just enough architects say enough of this. We want to be architects. We don't want to be doing housing. <laughs> enough of all this political stuff. And so the idea kind of gets lost for a while, but I think it's coming back now. So sorry, that was a very, very quick thing, but just to say that um, the, the question of, knowledge transfer and to me in pedagogy it's almost like the same word it's it's whom you're transferring the knowledge to that, that you know that distinguishes between pedagogy and other things definitely not only from one geography to another but from a, a, a field uh, of Absolutely. knowledge to another and the third point that I wanted, so maybe you can all uh, three react, is about the emergency of a new professional role that I think uh, it's across uh, all, the, all the presentations. Uh, and if you can, Monica, while uh, uh, answering, explaining why you selected exactly in all these uh, terms that emerged uh, the notion of generalist. Just as a wider clarification. So if uh, these are just thematic, and so if you want to... I was just just about saying something about what uh, Abigail yeah. was saying, because I think her case studies um, is very key um, on a, a certain aspect uh, about, about the role of pedagogy, because at a certain point, the architect uh, is transferring uh, 
um, is, is transferring uh, not not exactly the knowledge, but who the knowledge is to be. Uh, <laughs> so the student is not the, the the architectural student anymore, but it's someone else that will be applying uh, that knowledge. So then self help starts to emerge and all that stuff. And that's uh, also I think a bit why uh, the architects. Uh, are also a little bit disappointing, disappointed with housing. Housing is not so appealing anymore. So what is my role within housing, right? Uh, so I think there's also a, a certain point in time during the 20th century when housing starts um, to, to be questioned also from the pedagogical uh, point of view. And that's, I think also now turning to uh, Gaia's question, the, this um, maybe this overwhelming uh, excess of uh, having to be so generalist, having having to know so many things that then there is actually no role for the architect anymore. So um, so having to be the, the sociologist, having to be the the um, the anthropologist, having to be so many things that where where am I in the middle of of this everything, right? <laughs> so. Um, so I think uh, that there's uh, I well the generalist came from this discussion, which is, I mean, coming back to Vitruvius, he was pointing that our uh, our formation should be a very generalist one. So this is from the very beginning, but from a humanist point of view. Uh, but then you know, in the in the 20th century, you, we have like <laughs> something more. Not not just a humanist. Not we don't need to be only a. We don't need only to know about music, like Vitruvius was saying about music and drawing and all these things. But also, <laughs> about also <laughs> about sociology <laughs> and anthropology <laughs> and this and that. So the spectrum is opening and opening and opening. So we were always asked to be generalists, in fact, but this, this, um, this uh, question, in fact, asks us to be a, a really huge specialized uh, professional, <laughs> in fact. And that's why then we are not taking uh, taking many times not um, taking uh, for a serious like a serious professional because then we don't know exactly anything um, in a in a real depth. Um, so I think that uh, housing design for architects it's really a ground that can help to question uh, this because your idea of generalist across both Giovanni uh, interdisciplinary perspective that emerged in the same period where ethnographical, anthropological, and social science entered, and also Abigail uh, discourse on the crash, the crisis of experts that I think uh, uh, brought to this. Uh, to this. So it's uh, very interesting. Uh, sure. Uh, well, I, I will just add something because uh, what Monica was saying was uh, making me think that, um, of course, that was reminding me of that uh, sentence by Alvaro Siza that we are in some way becoming the specialists of nothing special, and <laughs> uh, which means that, uh, of course, it's a, it's a kind, it's some kind of a, of a claim. Uh, I mean. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice quote to drop in a to drop in a presentation, but uh, it, it's a claim. Uh, it's a claim for uh, for cross cross disciplinarity, most of all. And it also made me think of one single project, uh, and then I, I'm going to explain you why, because uh, it made me think of that um, uh, of that project uh, that was Previ. If I if I talk about the Previ project, I I, I see heads nodding because I, I I know that it's basically cutting across all of our research where, because it was a uh, was one of the first uh, the first occasions where, where sorry Gaia. Oh, sorry, I, I realized that uh, Abigail also was saying that uh, unfortunately in 10 minutes it's going to start the next uh, session and she has to okay, change. So... <laughs> so I'm really sorry to close the, the, the discussion. Okay, let's hurry. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want, didn't want it to be there, but I wanted to. Uh, surely there will be occasions. Uh, okay. Okay. Also, your research. 
and I would like just to thank really the all of you for uh, Abigail, Giovanni, Monica, Alice for the presentation that I think offer a lot of points uh, of uh, for our uh, enriching our discussion about uh, the architecture of housing in this uh, conference. Okay, sorry for the. <laughs> sorry, I'm the one who has to leave. We have to start in ten minutes yeah. uh, with the next uh, the next session. I guess we had a lot to say between each other, so so it's mm. great. Very nice to meet all of you. <laughs> thank really, you, really. thank you, Gaia. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you also to all the participants. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.